us today. And for those of um, you who are just joining us today, um, thank you for spending the second day of the conference with us. Um, we had a very um, inspiring conference um, day yesterday. Um, and um, yeah, with, with a lot of interesting inputs, uh, with uh, lively discussions, and also a poster session where we looked into the future of some cities uh, in the MENA region. Um, on the wall of ideas um, of the digital platform, you can have a look at the posters again, um, as well as um, uh, uh, at, uh, interesting uh, links um, to certain websites and pages um, that the speakers mentioned yesterday. Um, and the second day of uh, the conference um, also has uh, exciting topics in store. Um, we will start with a session on nature-based solutions and green in infrastructure um, as space um, for um, urban development and um, challenges and opportunities. Um, this will be followed by a session on inclusive urban mobility, uh, which has already been discussed uh, at many sustainable um, cities conferences in, in the past. Um, the question there is, um, how can we develop sustainable, inclusive public transportation within the region? And we will also have a special focus on women in the transport sector. Um, and for wrapping up the, the 10th uh, anniversary of the conference, um, we have planned a very special uh, session. Um, we will um, yeah, look back and also look ahead at the same time. Um, we, will, um, we will discuss or, um, about like where are we now, um, where are we heading, and um, how are we getting there. But for now, um, I don't want to delay um, the, the first uh, session of this conference, and I wish you all a successful day with uh, fruitful discussions. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, you never take up on time. You're just like summarize everything so uh, nicely. And thank you for that. Um, so if you allow me, we can just head start our, our day now with our first session of Nature Based Solutions. I kindly ask our colleague Kareem. Here he is. So the floor is yours, Kareem. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for this panel on, on green infrastructure in the MENA region. I would ask all the speakers to please. Uh, turn on your cameras and join us so we can see you all in your full glory. Uh, excellent. Great. Um, wonderful. So uh, thank you all for joining us for this uh, panel on green infrastructure uh, in the MENA region. I, uh, I would love the particular subject for this conference and I'll explain why. Uh, green infrastructure is um, a set of relatively simple relatively low cost planning and landscape design measures that we could simply use to transform cities and transform the lives of people uh, in them in this region. Um, often sometimes described as blue and green infrastructure, but I would leave that to some of our speakers to tell us why, but these simple um, networks of natural and semi-natural uh, features can really be really small or really large uh, within the city can have a transformative effect and they really only require a simple change of perspective and they can do so many things for a city they could uh, support urban sustainability they can support urban resilience they can reduce urban heat islands they can improve outdoor thermal comfort stormwater management you name it um, they could improve your permeability for your for your for your city uh, they can even capture carbon if you use the right uh, uh, species uh, you could grow food, help you grow food, reduce pollution possibly. It's, it's just the, the spectrum of things that green infrastructure could do for you with a simple change of perspective is, is really incredible. And this is all on top of what we really think of as the social, economic and psychological benefits for, for having landscape features uh, in, in a city. So as a subject, it's, it's in my mind, I find it really incredible. But surprisingly, it's hardly discussed and hardly discussed most of most places in the world, let alone in this region. As a matter of fact, I think this is probably the first um, panel on green infrastructure in the region um, that has happened. So I'm quite excited 
about all the presentations, all the discussions with our four esteemed speakers. So we'll speak for the next uh, hour and 35 minutes. Uh, they are free to speak in Arabic or English as, as they see fit. And I encourage all of you to send any questions that you have as soon as you can, because we have a packed uh, conversation today and we would only be ha have time to answer the questions, not to listen to the questions. So send your questions via Q&A, via the chat, uh, wherever you can. I'll compile those and um, prepare those for, for the speakers to respond to uh, immediately after the presentations. Um, so the first speaker that we have is um, Dr. Amir Gohar, who will briefly explain to us the principles of green infrastructure and how they can apply to the MENA region. Dr. Amir is a senior lecturer and, and an MLA course leader in landscape architecture at the University of Huddersfield. He has taught at many universities, UC Berkeley, San Francisco State University, Kansas State, Geneva Institute of Graduate Studies, the University of Geneva. Um, before that, he has spent two decades with municipal governments, research institutes, international development agencies, private sector. Uh, he's really done his rounds and he's worked extensively on public spaces, specifically in congested cities and also in coastal settlements. Um, his research focuses on finding appropriate balances between the uh, trends of rapid urbanization and ecological integrity in open spaces and cities. He's also a founding member of Midan, which is a nonprofit dedicated to uh, placemaking and, and public space rehabilitation. He has his, his, his doctorate from, from UC Berkeley, which focused on coastal development uh, and its direct and uh, in relative impact on, on local residents and the environment. And he also has a master's degree from, uh, from Cairo University and a master's uh, from urban design uh, from Oxford Brooks and a diploma also in land management from Erasmus University. So I don't think you'll have any anyone better to tell us about green infrastructure in the MENA region than Amir. So Amir, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes to, to introduce the subject to us. Wow, what a massive introduction. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here and I'm <clears throat> very pleased to be invited. And I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from uh, you guys as the real experts in the field. Um, since I have um, 20 minutes, I will share my screen now. Um, you, you see this? Um, yeah, you can see it. If you make it full screen, that would be great. Yes, we'll full screen. Working? Uh, not yet. Oh, now it's working. Great. All right. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about blue green infrastructure because before we move to my amazing colleagues from Amman, who is going to tell us how the real thing is actually done. So I'm going to go through some very basic, simple ideas. Uh, we'll talk about the BGI and gray infrastructure. What are the BGIs? BGI and regular infrastructure, similar concepts, because the concept actually existed before the term. And some classifications, lessons, concerns, and just a case study. And I'll leave you with one slide that I called it food for thought. Um, how can I? Yes. Um, so as we all know, regular or gray infrastructure is, the, is a general term for the basic uh, physical system of cities, regions, or nations. And these are some pictures for um, what comes to our mind when we say um, infrastructure. And these are the conventional um, development that occurs under that name. Um, Blue-green infrastructure um, is an approach to urban flood resilience recognized globally and international, in the international literature um, that capitalize on the benefits of working with urban green spaces and natural water system. So we're talking here about a major shift to something that takes into account nature, ecosystem, uh, mainly water cycles, but also other habitats that come with that. And this transition didn't happen overnight. It actually happened gradually. So as I mentioned earlier, um, gray infrastructure like roads, sewer, water pipes, electric towers are more centralized. They, are, they usually conflict with the ecosystem. Imagine every highway conflicts with water streams, animals crossing. So these are the kind of infrastructure that didn't take into account the environment. Then comes what they call green gray infrastructure, which is doing business as usual, but taking into account a little bit the um, environment, um, slow release of, to um, the sewer or uh, traditional engineering following ecological guides. And I would say 
if I use the same um, metaphor example of the highway, it will be like a highway, but a little bit elevated wherever the water flows or animals. So it's still uh, conventional, but take into account some environmental uh, consideration. Then shifting to green infrastructure, which is a um, network of wetlands, floodplain restorations. This allows more infiltration, improved uh, permeability, um, improves water quality, reduce erosion. And here, when we build our cities, to adjust and, and fix um, the damage we've done through uh, time. So take into account the um, environment. So it's centered around the environment. And I want to say that this is uh, probably a new term, but not a uh, very new practice. So it's been uh, adopted uh, before the term is uh, found. And I would like to borrow that hand-drawn uh, section by William Marsh where that is introduced, I think in the mid 80s, but it's been uh, practiced um, before we reach the point we are in now. And I, if I would drift and say a um, small opinion, I would actually strongly believe that our own in, in the Middle East and our own villages and towns in the 1900 were more uh, sustainable than the practice we're trying to achieve now. So I'm saying that this concept of sustainability and the BGI existed, although it wasn't termed or named um, like that. <clears throat> These are some concepts before the, the name BGI came out. Uh, there are something landscape planners use called Greenway, which is a network of wildlife reserves and corridors that should serve as a skeletal framework of comprehensive greenway systems. And this is um, a network of uh, green spaces that connect um, environmental units in the city. It also can be cultural greenway, where something like Christ trout or um, 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 so greenway also includes cultural landscapes another term is green infrastructure which is more or less what we're talking about but the blue was added to incorporate water so green infrastructure is a strategically planned network of natural and semi-natural areas so these all these concepts all overlap um, they're not um, very different, but as the term evolved, we add a name to it. So it was green, now it is blue-green. Um, ecological networks, also another term that is used, um, which is representations of the interaction that occur between species within a community. And the interaction include competition, mutualism, and predation. And a network properties of particular interest include stability and structure. So here, when we look at the interaction between animals and how um, or organisms in general, it could be plant species, plant, uh, trees, communities, etc., and how they interact together. We also have a term called ecosystem services, um, and it's it very it, it introduces benefits to humans provided by the natural environment and from healthy ecosystems. And this can include so many uh, things where you use the open public spaces in uh, urban farming or. Um, water storage or water purification. So again, it, it goes around the, um, the same concept. Um, here is a small difference between conventional versus BGI solutions. So in the conventional solution, storm drain functions only for stormwater conveyance and levees only for flood prevention. So everything in the conventional solution has a specific purpose and it's a single purpose. While in the BGI, uh, focuses on decentralized nature-based solutions that are often multifunctional. So a rain garden can function for not only stormwater quality treatment, but also flood mitigation and environmental education, also aesthetic values and providing recreational space, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how it actually works, it, it, it aims to introduce the natural water cycle into the urban environment and provide effective measures to manage fluvial, river coastal and fluvial urban runoff uh, surface water flooding. So when we usually, in the, in the past few decades, we built cities not taking into account much the water cycle and some countries and some states and some nations are more advanced than other in uh, implementing that. But um, collectively, we are still uh, way behind. And as a result of that, we have a lot of uh, environmental issues like droughts and pollution in oceans and blue water bodies. Um, in relation to climate change, um, 
BGI, um, let's, let's roughly say that mitigation is avoiding and reducing emissions of heat that is uh, trapping, <clears throat> trapping greenhouse gas into the atmosphere to prevent the planet from warming uh, more. And the adaptation is the altering our behavior systems and in some cases, ways of life. So although BGI falls more within the adaptation, I like this diagram because it shows actually, no, it falls in between. Um, there are more probably perception that it is part of adaptation and that's true, but it also helps in um, the mitigation that we need to uh, take into account. Um, it has um, so many functions. Uh, also, lots of the discussions about it is uh, more focusing on the ecological, like water storage, uh, regulators of river systems, habitat for plants and animal wildlife, growth of wetland. But it actually has a lot of social dimensions as well, as I believe uh, my colleagues after that is going to discuss further. Um, zones for recreational activities, uh, social integration, areas of community activities, and also aesthetic values. There are some obstacles to BGI. That's why we don't obviously see them everywhere around us. Um, namely, I can do these quick bullets. Lack of awareness, extensive planning is needed actually to put it in place. Uh, lack of political will. And apparently in our region, things need a lot of political will from the leadership. Um, lack of resources, although that's defendable when you think long-term plan, but again, um, our leaders and elected, if they are elected <laughs> politicians, uh, do not think long-term plan. Um, massive land use change is needed to, um, to start to accommodate those uh, blue-green infrastructure spaces, especially within congested cities or especially within cities of historic values that are difficult to do intervention in. Um, a little bit of classification. So according to the position or location, some of them could be within um, on the ground or a little bit lower than the ground, especially when it comes to uh, water reservoirs or uh, main uh, river or streams. And it also can be above ground, which is um, like introduced um, walls or roof planting. This is an example of uh, parking a car park or a parking garage that can include um, a lot of um, Green, uh, green areas that would mitigate for um, like heat islands, et cetera. Um, the classification according to scale, they actually operate on different scales. So on the regional scale, BGI would be, examples of BGI would be parks, agricultural lands, protected areas, detention ponds, and wetlands. This is a very massive and, and could be across borders and across states, sometimes across nations. Uh, on the urban and city scale, BGI examples would be public squares, city parks, recreational places, riverbanks within cities, and green walkways. And these are some pictures that shows the scale we're talking about. And then the smallest scale would be the architecture or the building scale, where, as I mentioned earlier, we can have green roofs, green walls, wall gardens, and rainwater containers. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the lessons and concerns here. Um, let's start with lessons. So. BGI are crucial to adaptation and not an option anymore. So this is not a luxury as some of the our uh, politicians or decision makers might think. Um, it needs for ongoing management. And that's very important even beyond the uh, electoral cy cycle or even beyond a uh, specific administration. Um, it's important to educate the people, especially in part this part of any part of the world where, there is, where they vote because the, they can um, influence the decision maker. They can influence, approve certain bills and Im allocate specific budget for that or not. So the buy-in of the community, especially in bottom-up uh, decision-making process or democratic societies is, is crucial. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, I've practiced and lived with a lot of uh, democratic societies that doesn't have that level of awareness. So it doesn't mean the more democratic, the more you have BGI. That's, they don't correlate from my stand or from my experience. Um, across institution coordination, which is something usually in governments and bureaucrats is very difficult to accomplish, uh, but it's very important because it it requires a lot of cooperation between central government and um, local government and implementing agencies. 
public participation is key. As I mentioned earlier, people's buy-in and engagement in not only the decision-making, but the maintenance and the ongoing uh, activities within BGIs. The concerns are, I'm looking at the time here. <laughs> um, sometimes climate change is not included at all as a strategy. So introducing blue-green infrastructure becomes something that, that lacks the overall framework or the overall vision. And that makes it a challenge or a standalone pilot. Um, I've worked in most of East Africa and South Africa and Latin America whenever I come across um, ideas to introduce BGI or green infrastructure. If it, if it doesn't, if the policymakers do not have climate change as part of that um, agenda, then they will, they will be unable to allocate budget or it will not help them get elected or collect voters, et cetera. Um, um, doubt so that future government will sustain such a project. And, and I think that applies to everything, not only BGI. Um, with especially with shuffling in government's direction and orientation. Um, um, some governments would be more interested in environmental issues and put a long-term plan, then the government shuffle and some other different leadership with different values, different concepts step in and just stop funding such activities. Um, and sometimes, as we know, sometimes they just reverse it, not only ignore it. This case happened in the US a lot. <clears throat> Ensuring social equity while developing BGI is not always guaranteed because they don't, it's not necessarily, BGIs are not necessarily equally and evenly distributed across different socioeconomic classes and different uh, demographic, and they do not uh, necessarily serve marginalized communities equally as much as they do where they're built with other communities that have privilege of education, choice, and finance and budget. Um, yeah, I, I talked about the security buy-in, um, securing the buy-in of the community, um, political will is a challenge, um, lack of resources, and I said that point is defend <clears throat> defensible because the avoided damage is always higher cost. And the last thing is that um, it requires a massive uh, land use change. Um, I'll talk about one case study before I come to a conclusion and leave it to my colleagues who are going to tell us their real um, on the ground experience. So Singapore um, had this interesting uh, ABC project. It's launched in 2006. Um, it aims to uh, improve the recreational values, physical appearance, and water quality of all water in Singapore. By the way, I picked Singapore because I tried to avoid United States and Europe. But at the same time, I wasn't able to locate <laughs> case studies in that I know of. I know some of them started recently, but I couldn't find something that is tested in our part of the world, although I'm sure there is, but that I'm not aware of. So in the past, Singapore's surface water management focused solely on efficient drainage for flood control and water collection for water supply. And most rivers and streams in Singapore have been heavily channelized, as we see in this picture which sometimes um, hydrologists call it a city fountain, but it's not a river anymore because it, it's deprived from its ecological purposes. It's just a water channel. Um, the problem here is drain directly into the receiving water bodies, stormwater runoff is a major source of pollution in Singapore's water network. So what they did is the common measure include greening of the embankment and the waterfront area, adding amenities such as benches and loop put decks along the waterfront, building wires to form a permanent pool for the water and using um, all our different kinds of soil um, techniques to naturalize the embankment. Um, this is a picture from that project and we can see it has um, done the it, it does the ecological purpose but it also i always focus on the social purpose and uh, which which is not always highlighted when we talk about bgi but it's actually a very nice recreational uh, space where people can uh, interact especially in congested cities um this case study um is very interesting because the 
original 2.7 kilometer con concretized, <laughs> concretized channel. Um, it was a straight channel that has been transformed into 3.2 kilometers naturalized. So it has no more meandering, more natural, and it improved the biodiversity and the ecosystem. Um, it's called the uh, Kalang River and the morphology, it changed a lot after that project. Um, so it has meander beds, varying channel widths, rock beds and uh, vegetated banks. And these are important to um, manage erosion and in, in enrich the biodiversity of the area, improve the flow pattern and provide a variety of wildlife habitat. Biodiversity has increased in this uh, park by 30%, which is, I think, massive. Um, this park now resembles a natural river corridor, which entails not only a channel, but also a closely interacting floodplain and riparian zone. So it goes a little bit more, actually, a lot more than uh, being an enhanced and improved piece of infrastructure. It serves the environment and the ecosystem beyond what uh, we can possibly imagine. Um, these are the features installed in that project. Um, I'm not, I don't need to go through the list. I'll just say that these are vegetated swales, bioretention swales, also sediment basins, constructed wetlands, cleansing biotops. So across that meandering rivers, there are nodes and um, spots for um, so blue and green infrastructure is a is a that connected network that served Singapore so well, and that's why uh, it improved the biodiversity by thirty percent. I think that is the case study. I leave you for a food for thought since I have one more minute. Um, if you are a mayor of, uh, I don't need an answer. I just want you to think about this and leave. I leave you that. If you are a mayor or a city planner uh, working given a specific piece of land and you have um, to put 50% of that as green infrastructure open space and the other 50% is developable area or buildable area. And you have the, all the freedom to allocate your green versus gray um, zones. So the gray is the built and the green is the open space. In that continuum, how would you distribute the two colors? It's a very hypothetical question. There's no right and wrong, but the more you go to the dense, the more you serve the ecosystem because that big uh, green space here would allow wolves and bears and rivers and trees to recover and become a big chunk of environment. And the more you go to the fragmented one, these will be like small city parks that doesn't allow the environment to recover much, but it allows equal access to public space for people. So I would argue, I would argue that the more you go towards E, you get higher social values and, and community integration. And the more you go to A, you get more ecological values and you can stay in the middle. Um, that's part of a paper I published, but I don't have the link to it here, but it, it's just a food for thought. And uh, now I'm on 20, so I will, and these are my references. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer your question. I leave the floor to Karim, shukran Karim. Thank you so much, Amir Shukran. I, I just want to quick make a quick comment uh, that touches on your terminology and also on the uh, buy-in from the public. Uh, it's the Chinese example uh, where uh, due to recent flooding, uh, China has mandated that different cities find solutions. So one city created something that it called a sponge city and then the more cities have adopted that and then china now has mandated that a large number of cities now must now become sponge cities mm -hmm. and and uh, that comes from the top down command economy the uh, the party said that uh, the cities shall become sponge cities and they should manage their stormwater using green roofs and parks and ponds and wetlands and uh, and all of these things um and the Good municipalities point. have, and the municipalities are going to have to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, very, very little discussion in terms of buy-in from the from the public. Uh, but it's a different different model. We'll see how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, but enough about other parts of the world. We now zoom in on the Middle East, specifically on Jordan, because we have fantastic uh, case studies from the Jordan on the application of green infrastructure or blue green infrastructure or 
nature-based solutions or sponge, whatever we're going to call them today. So the first up we have uh, is, is Dima Bouthieb, who's an urban planner. Uh, with 20 years of experience, she's been managing the, she's, she's a manager at, at uh, UN Habitat. Um, um, and and um, uh, she's been doing that for the last three years. She's, her work tends to focus on improving living conditions of vulnerable people. Um, um, uh, and and specifically local uh, local communities, refugees as well, as well as building capacity of natural and, and local environments to respond to uh, urban development challenges. Um, this includes her work generally includes also uh, natural and urban policies, localizing sustainable development goals and the new urban agenda, improving access to safe and inclusive public space for social cohesion and livelihood opportunities and building resilience for communities uh, to climate change, water and water related issues. Um, Dima holds a bachelor's degree in, degree in architecture and a master's degree in spatial planning. So she has a fantastic case study uh, that she would share with you. And Dima, you have 25 minutes. Um, if, if you really must push it, we'll, we'll, we'll have to have less questions. Yeah, I'll do um, my best. Okay. No worries. Thank you so Thank much, you. Karim, for this introduction. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Can you see my screen? Okay. Thank you, Amir. <laughs> so um, it's a pleasure actually to be here with you for the fourth or fifth time with uh, Frederick Ebert Stiftung uh, participating as a speaker on behalf of UN Habitat. Um, today I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, take you actually through one of our um, important projects, which called the strengthening social stability and resilience of vulnerable Jordanians and Syrian refugees in Amman against flash flood. We have been implementing this project, project since like more than one year, and it is funded by Japan um, government. Um, let me put it on full screen. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those who are not aware of UN Habitat, UN Habitat is one of the UN agencies which is mandated by uh, General Assembly to manage the portfolio of uh, sustainable urbanization. And we are mainly uh, concerned with the um, sustainable development goal number 11, which is uh, making cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Um, we're working about, uh, we're working based on our strategic plan, which is 2020-2023. Um, which focuses on four domain of changes. The, the third one is focusing on climate change and it aims to strengthen climate action and improve the urban environment globally. And also we align our priorities with the um, governmental needs here in Jordan. Why we focus about cities? Because actually cities uh, are where the climate change battle will largely be won or lost. And cities are consuming actually the majority of, of our energy and also consumes or produce more than 60% of greenhouse gas emissions um, in the world. And most of the population, or actually more than half of the population are residing in cities. Uh, we have al already engaged and um, uh, endorsed a new urban agenda. It's an action-oriented plan in which we commit to integrate climate change adaptation and mitigation consideration into urban and territorial development. And that one was um, endorsed by most member states in 2016 in Quito. So basically the structure of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the overall project of the flash flood here in Amman. Then I'll move to the flash flood risk assessment and hazard mapping that we have done. It's an evidence-based document that could be actually taken further by decision makers and uh, donors, as well as financial institutions to implement additional uh, recommendations. Then I'll jump directly to our small pilot projects, which called Azhur Green Triangle, which is located in, in uh, Azhur, uh, Jabal Azhur area in Amman, in Eastern Amman. And finally, I'll show and share with you some of the awareness campaign messages and video that we will be launching before the winter season next month. So the overall objective of the project, as it entails from the, the title, is to strengthen governmental and community resilience and capacity to better manage flash floods through implementation of flood resilient infrastructure. So it's mainly targeting governmental entities um, aiming to build their awareness, sorry, their capacity, as, as well as the communities and showing them some simple practices 
if they apply it, they can contribute a lot to reduce the risk of flash flood. Our partners is mainly Greater Miami Municipality and Ministry of Water and Irrigation. And as, as I mentioned, the project is funded by Japan government and the overall budget of the project is around 1 million US dollar. Half of it is going to implement some tangible and demonstration projects on the ground. And the time frame uh, of the project is, originally it was one, one year, but it um, started actually with COVID-19 outbreak. So there was a little bit delay in implementing our activities, but uh, officially it will be end in November, 2021, which means after two, two months. So basically why we chose Amman, because there was a study done by WFP, a sister agency, that shows that Amman's Alpine Air with Mafraq are most vulnerable to flash flood and epidemics to, due to high concentration of population and also high concentration of Syrian refugees in these areas. As many of you have uh, actually uh, saw this, this image when Amman was actually drawn with the flash flood, this is uh, a picture for downtown Amman. In 2019, when um, um, a strong flash flood incident hit the city and caused a lot of damages to infrastructure and also to um, some commodities and merch, a lot of merchants have been affected by that flash flood. I'll share, I'll play a short video for a lady who participated in one of our um, community consultation session where she is pointing to the issue of flash flood. So that lady actually was pointed uh, was pointing to the main issues that cause flash flood in the city, which is insufficient capacity of current drainage system in the city. Um, the main culvert that uh, absorb of all rainwater is, is called Saqf cell and it's located in downtown Amman. So it's not able to accommodate more and more actually of the rainfall. Uh, also the rapid and significant, significant urban development um, in the watershed. Um, Amman has been actually uh, grown out um, largely and absorbed a lot of uh, population. Uh, so um, after the construction of the culvert, Amman has expanded by 170 square kilometer. And also the main issue also is with the impact of climate change and the change in the pattern of rain, uh, where we have a short actually rain with intense perci precipitation level. Um, as I mentioned, this project is aligned with the main um, priority areas for Greater Amman Municipality, which is the Amman Climate uh, Plan that was developed in 2019 by the World Bank, which calls for um, short period, uh, short period um, uh, interventions focusing on green infrastructure here to capture treat and treat stormwater in public spaces. So basically, the project has three main outcomes. The first one is focusing on improving protection and resilience to flooding in the targeted population, targeted project area in downtown Amman. And secondly, reduced vulnerability of refugees and local communities to flash floods. And uh, the third one is focusing on building capacity of greater Amman municipality to better manage flash floods and mainstream green infrastructure in the urban planning processes within the municipality. We've started the whole project by doing like a flood risk assessment and hazard mapping, which I called it an evidence-based study for additional actually um, uh, implementation of this recommendation. We have um, a specific criteria, then we develop the hydraulic model, Amman 
the greater Miami security helped us a lot with mapping the existing infrastructure within downtown Amman because they were necessary uh, input into the model. Then we validated the model and um, uh, did the flash uh, hazard mapping for different return periods, one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, and 100 years. Then we came up with a flood hazard mapping that showed uh, the flood hotspots within the city. And finally, we came with short, medium, long-term recommendations for decision makers. We were not able to implement all these recommendations, but we picked the one that is related to green infrastructure. So the hazard mapping has a um, degree of um, uh, the, the degree of flood hazard actually ranges from low, moderate, significant, and extreme uh, hazard, as, as you see on the screen. So basically, it was based also on the velocity and um, uh, the depth uh, of the rain. And this one is showing the hazard in 2019 incident. As you can see from the screen, the majority of the color is um, green, which is low hazard. But when we move to two years, we start to see some moderate hazard. Then five years, we started to see some um, other colors, significant hazard. Then with 10 years, you can see more red areas here. And here is the Roman theater, which is an important, uh, actually, historical site. And here is also a greater municipality. Then with the 25 year, you can see more extreme, actually, uh, hazard within downtown Amman. And when, when we go to 50, you can see more red. And with 100 year, you can see that the whole area is extremely, actually, hazardous. Um, uh, with floods. So we need really to take um, appropriate actions, otherwise we will have serious actually implication of flash flood in Amman. Based on this study, we came up with short, short and long-term solutions. The short-term solution was focusing on the maintenance of existing culverts, introducing new interceptors, and introducing the concept of green infrastructure solutions, while the long-term solution was to update Amman master plan, diversion projects and um, uh, constructing a new a new culvert. And we helped a man, um, greater municipality in developing a profile for the diversion project and put it on a city investment website for um, additional or interested investors to finance this project. So this, this map shows actually the hazard before and after we implement the short, the long-term solution, you can see the difference between the level of hazard here we have a lot of, of grid areas here, but we have little grid areas here after we implement, if we implement the long-term recommendations. So moving to our pilot project, green infrastructure, we invested, we actually explored a lot of green infrastructure solution. I'm not going to go through them because already Amir provided some introduction about these solutions, but we have, within our project, we have focus on attenuation bonds, bioretention areas, and um, also uh, filter strips. And we have analyzed each of these solutions uh, against their uh, pros and cons. And we have focused within our studies on three solutions, which is bioretention, detention area, filter strips, and attenuation bonds. For our study, we have identified like 120 sites across Amman, the whole city. And within each location, we identify which type of intervention Amman can implement because uh, as part of our project, we are implementing only one bioretention project, but later on, a man can take this study and give it to other people, or even if they can allocate some fund to implement um, these studies. So the, 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 the study is available within a greater municipality, and it shows the identified uh, locations for these interventions. For our project, it's called Azuhuri Green Triangle. Um, the location is, is located in eastern Amman at the cross uh, section of uh, uh, Bab al Khalid and Al Quds Street. And here is the location in comparison to downtown Amman. So we chose an upstream location for our project rather than doing a project on downstream locations. So we prevent the risk uh, of flush that is going to downtown Amman. Here is the catchment area, which covers like eight um, uh, square kilometer, which is a huge area. And we're focusing on our project on the concept of stormwater detention by having like an underground stormwater tank 
which um, uh, detain the water for a little bit, and then we can have a slow release for the water or use it for irrigation purposes after the storm. And we have utilized the concept of bioretention by introducing, introducing a series of bioretention areas within our site so that, that collected water could be infiltrated into underground water or evaporated through the plants. This is the location of the site, and this is the location of the underground stormwater tank. And we have connected our site, um, whether the bioretention area or the underground water tank, with the um, existing stormwater network, which is located um, along Bab al Khalil and Al Quds Street. So we can collect the stormwater here from this pipe and um, send it to the bioretention area. And also, here we have another inlet for the underground stormwater tank. So each each actually um, intervention has like um, control valves in order to be able to reduce the inflow into the project, even shut it down in case of maintenance or emergencies. So we have a control over um, uh, the water that is coming to our site. So uh, this shows the layout of the whole project, which consists of a series of bioretention area. Here is the first bioretention area, and this is the second, and this is the third. Uh, the site is steepy, so um, the higher actually uh, location is located here and going down to this point, and we have an outlet here for the water and a drain point for the water, and we have two bioswells. Here is the first bioswells, and the second bioswells is located here. The underground water tank and the detention intervention is located below this um, bioswell area. Here, here is a, a cross section for the site um, and showing the series of bioretention area, the first one, and here is the second one. And it shows the layers of the bioretention area, which infiltrates the stormwater into the ground and um, recharge underground water. It consists of um, um, a layer of pebbles and a layer of um, uh, mixed soil and a natural soil. So these are very simple techniques that could be utilized to um, reduce the risk of flash flood, uh, and we call it service actually interventions. And these are some details for the stormwater tank where you can see the inlet of the water here, and we have also the outlet here. We have, we introduced also a small pump to pump the water into an irrigation a water tank to irrigate um, the site uh, with the water. So it's not only for reducing the risk of the flash flood, but rather than utilizing it for irrigation purposes, because you are aware that uh, Jordan is the second most scarce country in the world. Some additional details about the outlets and uh, how how the system actually works. And here the outlet is connected to another pipe that is taking the overflow water to the existing culvert uh, in a month, but definitely after, um, after the storm incidents. Here are um, some images, the final images for the site. Uh, we will start implementing it next month in October, and hopefully it will be ended within four uh, months. Um, it's showing the joyous cells that we have utilized for bioretention areas. The first one, second one, and third one is located here. And these are the bioswells, and um, they goes the, the, the overflow goes to the second bioretention and then goes to the bioswell to the last uh, bioretention area, and the overflow is going outside the site. So as you can see, it looks like a public space, but since it's located um, um, within the right of way, um, we're a bit concerned of um, uh, using it for, for, for actually public um, uh, purposes, uh, unless a man could uh, plan um, a proper pedestrian crossing ways or um, uh, traffic lights for pedestrian uh, people. Here is also another shot that shows them the slope and the levels of the site. We tried also to use some native species that is uh, uh, yeah, actually indigenous, indigenous to Amman context. This one is showing the bioswell that goes to the last bioretention site. A final one that is showing the site from Al Quds Street. So, in addition to this, we're uh, launching also another uh, awareness campaign also by 14th of, 14th of October with um, our. Um, uh, Mayor of Amman and the ambassador, 
sending some messages to local communities, um, promoting some practices. If they implement it, they can actually contribute to reduce the risk of flash flood. These are including water harvesting because water harvesting is binding by law, but it's never enforced on the ground. So not many people are implementing water harvesting um, within their households, although it's required by law. So we're promoting the concept of water harvesting. And also in addition to this, to this project, we are implementing a community-based project in one of the sites in downtown Amman, also in a building that was originally built for uh, affordable housing by UN Habitat. And um, now it was handed uh, over to Greta Mime Spirity. Also, we're promoting the concept of uh, flash walls. There is a startup initiative here by one of the most active people who's trying to use this formation to protect the shops. Also, uh, when we dig into our site and th did the survey, we noticed that we could not able to take the invert level of one of the stormwater network because the site, uh, the, the, um, um, the culvert was not clean. So perhaps we need some, some more effort in cleaning and maintaining um, the network stormwater network system. Also, we're promoting the concept of permeable um, uh, tiling. Finally, I would like to show a video that we will be launching also as part of our community awareness campaign next month and it will be la the last slide. هل سألت نفسك يوما كيف يمكنك المساهمة في وقاية من الفيضانات المفاجئة والتقليل من آثارها إلى جنبك؟ قبل أن أجيب على هذا السؤال دعونا نطرح لكم بعض المعلومات المهمة في هذا الخصوص هل تعلم أن مساحة أسطح الأبنية في مدينة عمان تقدر ب 57 مليون متر مربع؟ وهل تعلم أيضا أن تخزين مياه الأمطار المتساقطة على هذه الأسطح يحد من تدفق مياه الأمطار إلى الشوارع ويخفف الضغط على شبكات تصريف الأمطار؟ وهل تعلم أن أحكام البناء في الأردن تنص على تحديد مواقع نقاط تصريف مياه الأمطار على سطح المبنى والأسطح الصلبة حول المبنى وفي الموقع وطرق تصريفها خارج الموقع وأخيرا هل تعلم أن كمية امتصاص المياه في المناطق المبلطة والمبنية قليلة بينما هي مرتفعة في المناطق الخضراء والمزروعة لنعود الآن للإجابة عن سبل الوقاية من الفيضانات المفاجئة والتقليل من آثارها وما هو دورها في ذلك أولا قم بتجهيز السطح في المبنى الخاص بك يمكنك البدء بتجهيزات بسيطة اليوم وتطويرها غدا تأكد من تركيب مزاريب على السطح وربطها في خزان تجميع مياه الأمطار تأكد من نظافة هذه المزاريب للحد من انسدادها عند هطول الأمطار حافظ أيضا على نظافة المصارف في الشوارع والأرصفة لتساعد في تصريف مياه الأمطار ثانيا ساهم معنا في رفع نسبة الغطاء الأخضر في مدينتنا ولكن كيف يمكننا ذلك؟ من خلال زيادة عدد الأسطح الخضراء في المدينة زراعة الارتدادات في الأبنية تبليط الأرصفة ببلاط نافذ للمياه زراعة جيوب خضراء في الأرصفة وأينما أمكننا ذلك انضم إلينا لنرفع جاهزية مدينتنا في مواجهة موسم الأمطار وذلك من خلال الحلول الوقائية التالية تركيب جدران مانعة للفيضانات على أبواب المحال التجارية في المناطق المعرضة لخطر الفيضانات أيضا تجهيز الأبنية ذات الطوابق تحت منسوب الطريق والأقبية في هذه المناطق وأخيرا المحافظة على نظافة العبارات والمناهل للحد من انسدادها والتقليل من خطر حدوث الفيضانات Finally, uh, today we will be conducting like a vocational training for Eastern Ammanese to um, raise their awareness on these um, green infrastructure practices, mainly water harvesting, and also um, uh, introducing green pockets within their households to um, build their resilience to flash flood and contribute to reduce the risk of flash flood on all Amman city uh, and also local communities. Thank you so much for listening and I'm ready to answer your questions.
Great. Thank you so much, Dima. That was wonderful. Uh, one takeaway I, I, I had were looking at the uh, hazard map was that um, anyone who looked at the satellite image of our men knew that that area was a water course one time, right? The, the Bustel Bellad was definitely a water course. So exactly. Some, sometime 100 years ago, someone built in the water course and uh, inevitably became very impermeable and in any flood event it will it's likely to, to happen so for us the lesson is don't build in the water course in the future exactly. if you can but it's too late i mean we're, we came in i mean the man was built around this place so um so that's it's not gonna we're now mitigating what the damage that has already been done to downtown our man but for us in the future don't create that problem in the first place so you don't have to fix it uh, exactly but, but mm -hmm. that was that was wonderful and i, I learned quite a lot from uh, from you today thank you so much so to move on to a different perspective and, and also perhaps a different scale of application uh, of green infrastructure we have two speakers to discuss a specific project uh, called the improving living conditions at disadvantaged areas in amman uh, two speakers are uh, rawan atur and uh, sajid al nsur who will provide um the view from different stakeholders to that project and also help us understand the challenges that face implementing green infrastructure uh, in Jordan and also interface with social issues. So we'll hear a lot about uh, in social interfaces. I think Dima has already uh, touched on that, but I think we'll hear a little bit more about that with this project. So Rawan is a project manager of the improving living conditions and the in this disadvantaged areas of Amman, uh, the GIZ. Previously, she's worked for UN Habitat. I don't know if she's worked at the same time uh, with Dima or not, but uh, I, I would imagine they might have met. Um, uh, where she worked, uh, Rowan worked as an urban urban planning expert, which is responsible for managing uh, Jordan's affordable housing project and mainstreaming biodiversity on, on tourism development. She's also been a consultant for UN Habitat Iraq program as part of a UN Habitat support for the government of Iraq and uh, improving its capacity for housing and land management. Uh, she's also uh, she was also the head of planning uh, division within the Royal Scientific Society, uh, and she worked on various master plans for several cities, including the Amman plan. Uh, urban envelope implementation, as well as master plans for other Jordanian cities. Uh, engineer Sajid al Nsur is a civil engineer who's been working uh, with the Great Amman Municipality for the last 13 years at the mayor's office. Um, she's a project manager for green infrastructure projects uh, at GAM or Great Amman Municipality in partnership with, uh, with the GIZ and the Ministry of Environment. Uh, her projects include the the project that we're talking about, improving living conditions and disadvantaged areas in Amman, and the urban micro lungs project. Uh, she is a member of the Climate Change Committee at, at GAM, and she's also a coordinator on behalf of GAM with the, with the C14 network. Uh, she also participates in the follow up process with the international collaborations collaborators of, of GAM. Um, so, Rawana and Sajida, you have the microphone. I hope you can limit this to 30 minutes in order to leave 15 minutes for questions and answers. If it overruns a little bit, means we have less than 15 minutes to answer any questions that we have to date. So, um, so over to you. Thank you, Karim. Thank you also for the introduction. And uh, as we have planned, actually, this presentation was supposed to be an integration and a representation from the various stakeholders. Also, we had a, a representative from the Climate Change Directorate from the Minister of Environment. Yet also climate change, this is what it requires from us. So there is an urgent meeting for the COP preparation and he had to apologize. Uh, so that's why me and Sajid are covering up for this. And it's interesting actually a point that you mentioned about the sale of Amman and uh, the planning decisions because other cities they were approaching actually to cover the continuation of the sale similar to Amman because they think that Amman is the module to follow. And we had uh, lots of struggles and the different master plans to prevent this. Uh, and luckily we succeeded. So now actually the work of UN Habitat working on the main streams and actually uh, absorbing the water from the uphills before it goes to the downtown. This is something uh, very valuable. Um, so actually in this presentation, it's gonna be alternation between me and Sajida. Uh, we're gonna be covering several parts of the project. Uh, let me share the presentation. And does it show? Uh, yes, not full screen though, so if you can make it full screen. Yeah. Is it now full screen? Okay, thank you. 
So uh, mainly, actually, we've divided the roles between us, and uh, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction uh, about the project. Um, and I would prefer, actually, that the uh, core of the work is going to be represented by our implementing partner. So Engineer Sajida is going to talk about the different case studies and some of the benefits of the green infrastructure. So in general, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to share key information and about the partners and steering structure. Uh, then we will talk about what is green infrastructure in principles and contribution by the Minister of Environment, uh, environmental benefits, social benefits of green infrastructure. Then um, we have like three examples uh, with various sites. So we have the ILCA, which is the improving of living conditions, uh, work of green infrastructure. There is the urban micro lungs. And also there is another project in the GIZ, it's cash for work, green infrastructure. So um, we'll explain about the various uh, contributions of these uh, projects. Uh, in terms of the ILCA project, I'll talk a little bit about the community participation and involvement, the co-design workshops, uh, baseline studies that have been done. Then there are three constructed sites and the urban micro lungs, later the publication and the cash for work project. So the ILCA project, it started in July 2017, and it's supposed to end in July 2020. This is when it was an extension due to the COVID circumstances, so it was supposed to end by uh, this year. Uh, the volume is 5 million euros, and the, the target group are actually the disadvantaged areas of Amman, so mostly it's in East Amman. It, uh, there isn't, let's say, 150,000 residents will benefit from this, in addition to capacity building that has been conducted with Greater Amman Municipality and the Ministry uh, of Environment uh, teams. Uh, so much of capacity building measures has been done. Uh, the activities, they, are, they vary between implementation of green infrastructure and improvement of these spaces, open spaces, providing services, accessibility, the community participation, capacity building, and also uh, publications contributing in the global agendas and in the national strategies. Um, the focal point uh, is from the Directorate of Climate Change is Bilal Shafarin. He uh, unfortunately uh, got engaged and apologized. Uh, from Greater Amman Municipality, it's Sajid al -Insur. And we have a steering structure for this project with GAM. It's, a, let's say, a steering committee on the political level, then on a smaller level, there is a technical committee that regularly follows up uh, and validates the discussions and next steps. Then there are core groups that are directly involved in the implementation, uh, and there are different members for the various stages of the project. Sajida, I'll give you the floor uh, now so that you can uh, share your part of the presentation, then I'll pick it up. Sajida? Yes, you heard me now? Yeah. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank all the organizers for this uh, conference. Uh, really, it's a great uh, opportunity for all us to share this experience with uh, such experts like you. Thanks, Karim, for the introduction, and also thanks, Dina, for uh, your continuous follow-up and uh, uh, coordination towards our contribution in this conference. Please, uh, Rawan, can you keep uh, share, share the, the screen? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Amir has uh, really a good, uh, very professional introduction about the green infrastructure, so I will not uh, repeat what he uh, already mentioned. Rawan, please, next. Yes, a green infrastructure is a strategically planned network of natural and semi-natural areas with other environmental features designed and managed to deliver a wide range of ecosystem services. As Dr. Amir and Karim mentioned that and brief, what is the definition of the green infrastructure? So in our uh, joint project with the GIZ and our political partner, Ministry of Environment, it, it integrated all the uh, green infrastructure uh, elements in our pilot project, and we will see later uh, this site. Uh, the green infra infrastructure principles is uh, has uh, habitability, interconnectivity, resiliency, and multifunctional, and also 
to keep identity and return on investment. Uh, the elements uh, and we use on uh, our uh, reputation side uh, these elements like permeable uh, beavers and uh, rainwater harvesting and also uh, native vegetations and various work. Uh, and the three sides of our project uh, is uh, we will mention later and you can see the elements that have been integrated. Uh, now we talk about uh, environmental uh, bef uh, benefits of the green infrastructure is to improve uh, the uh, improve the access for, to transportation and improve walkability and also access to the public green spaces improve stormwater and drainage and reducing flooding uh, and also this is can also reduce by uh, using a permeable pavement to reduce the heat island through permeable floors and reduce the water runoff which build which can build a flood resilience and uh, decrease the pressure on the uh, storm water infra existing storm water infrastructure so uh, the, the the global uh, urban challenge and the local urban challenge now the global urban challenge it we can like uh, may talk about the climate change and risk of uh, poverty about the uh, risk and ch challenges of the gam that have been faced greater amount of visibility is the demand of the electricity and demand of infrastructure which is, is progressively increased a man also is facing a, a number of climate hazard like a heat waves and a flash flood and tv snow which also dima has covered is the local uh, urban challenge also is uh, rapid urbanization, scarcity of the natural uh, resources, and um, topography of Amman and hilly slopes. Also, uh, successive in, in, in fluxes of refugees. So, yes, and no, I will go back a little bit for the uh, slide. And the lack of public uh, grid spaces, lack of resources, um, change of demographics, and low population density. The social uh, benefits, it will be divided on individual level and uh, community level. For the individual level, it's really direct impact on the physical well-being and health benefits and the quality time so that can they have an activity and also in our project, they have voluntary works, uh, some activity later on site activation, emotional also and physiological benefits. On the community uh, level, uh, it's to enhance their senses of the ownership and uh, belonging and participatory with uh, a good governance uh, attitude. And also really we feel that from the feedback of the, from this project as a participatory approach, that the feedback from this community that to be a part of this project since the first day until we finish, by participating the, in the workshop, in the co-design, in uh, all the site activation, all uh, we we involve all the community there, either they are residents or refugees. Yeah, this yes. is. Excuse me, Sajida. It's just I received a note that some of the participants are not able to see it clearly, and I'm not sure how I can change. The That's not screen. full screen mode, Rowan. It's uh, uh, presenter. It's I, presenter I mode. Yeah, presenter mode. How can I change it? You right you click. Can... Right click, I think. Okay, I'll tell you yeah. how I can change Project it. Feed. Just a second. Yeah, it works now. Yeah. So it in works? The, yeah, it's worked. Okay, yeah. now it's good. Yes, it is. Okay. So as I say that on community level, uh, after we uh, encourage in our uh, Elka site, we feel that uh, the new feelings from the residential there and how they feel very happy to be with us since the first day. Yes, now. 
Yes, Rowan, your turn. No, it's no, it's me. Okay. Yeah. So um, why I'm, am I displaying actually the different projects uh, that are have been done in green infrastructure? Partially because they each of them, they had a different contribution in terms of the typology that has been uh, used, but also because of the integration of these sites together. So for the Elka project, we had three sites in East Amman, two of them in the Nasser district and one in the Badr district. So the first one was a leftover land uh, and it has been rehabilitated. And then another one, which is a park, Mahmoud Lugda Park. And the third one is the seven stairs in the Badr district. If we add to this that we have in the coming this year until the end of the project, we have additional three sites that we are going to work on, uh, which are the extensions. There is a Manara Plaza maintenance, uh, also in the Nasser district. Uh, there is a small stairs that leads to the GAM building, and there is a sidewalk that is next to the park itself. So it's a, a complementing the work that has already been done. If we look at it in terms also of the urban micro lines, there was an, a project done in Al Manara Plaza in the Nasser district and uh, in uh, Marfa district also another one. And then we add to it the cash for work where they have worked on Abu Ala and Ma'ari Park in the Qusur district, the owner was cool and in Manara Park. So the idea also of the site selection, in addition that I'll talk about some of the baseline studies that were conducted uh, at the initiation of both projects for Ilka and the cash for work, we were uh, so much thinking also as part of the green infrastructure, the suitability of the sites, but also creating a network for a uh, continuation of creating some a more uh, a suitable environment for a biological uh, uh, um, purposes in addition to the social uh, aspects. So uh, for the ILCA project, uh, as I said, it started in 2017. There has been a baseline study for the site selection. Lots of community workshops have been conducted. Uh, there has been a participatory design conducted. Uh, then uh, three sites have been constructed and the, the latest was finished in July this year. Uh, there has been a second baseline study to select the uh, potential three sites in the future. We are at this stage where we have to work on the design and construction of these sites, but also to do some site activation to engage the different communities and increase their ownership in the sites that have been uh, finalized. In terms of the community engagement, uh, we had, let's say, various aspects. And if we go from the top to down, it, the community participation decreases. So it's more on, uh, they're more active on the research and baseline studies, on the co-design uh, and designing with them. Then what, the more we go into construction, they're still engaged and the, there are some site activation, they're still engaged in it, but in the management or and maintenance, it's of less, but we hope also that um, through the sense of ownership that we're building with the communities, uh, especially in various cases that we had in other projects, uh, women and children, if they get really engaged and they feel the sense of ownership, they uh, really contribute in the maintenance of the different sites. The co-design workshops for each site, we had six workshops were held with the community. Uh, there were a variety of methods used to engage the people at all age groups and genders. There were roadshows, town hall meetings, interviews, focus groups, discussion, community walks, and uh, even activities of Draw Your Neighborhood. Uh, the co-design workshops, they continued. So the different design elements after they have been designed, they have been introduced to the community and they voted on what they like. Uh, during the design and also during the construction, sometimes people uh, required certain elements and certain changes and new features that have been integrated also in the design as per the feedback of the community and women and children and men of different ages, they expressed their needs and these were translated into final designs. Uh, the baseline study assessment, I'm not going to go into the details, but it shows actually the different locations and the assessment that has been done in terms of the suitability, the different uh, typologies of the spaces. So we didn't focus on one type, we tried to put examples, different examples, because the main purpose of the 
project of the green infrastructure in addition to really implementing on the ground. Uh, a major component is the capacity building and to change the mindset uh, towards a more environmental and affordable solutions. So if we provide different typologies, then uh, we can have like more palettes of solutions to be uh, provided to the decision makers. Uh, Sajida, I guess this is where yeah. your share comes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now the three sites of the ELCA project, the site number one is leftover land at Nasser district, this one. It was used, as you see, as a parking uh, diesel trucks and the uh, rubbish dump. The condition was uh, where uh, quite poor and uh, the soil trash uh, built up. The community was not benefiting at all from this uh, vacant land. So this, this site number one. After rehabilitation, you can see this by adding the green infrastructure element like uh, a green uh, walls, in increasing the green cover and the shading, uh, disability access to ramps and handrails, adding lighting fixture, which was a reflection of the local community there, especially the women and the kids for the safety issue. And also uh, added a picnic area and some cement uh, seating tables. Interlock tiling uh, street also re that reduced the car speed in this uh, in this way, in this in this way, and added a sidewalks on Palestine uh, Street. Now uh, and the play area for the kids there. So the feedback we incorporated it uh, since two months, and the feedback from the local community is they are so happy and they asking us to repeat this and replicate it. And we can embed this strategy by participatory approach with the local community through our GAM strategy. Uh, site number uh, two is uh, Mahmoud Ligda Park at Nasser uh, district. This is the picture before. It's around 1,500 square meters uh, park and cent uh, centrally located adjacent to the stores and very busy area schools and residential building. A previous condition, including the football field, it was uh, really in very poor uh, condition and insufficient uh, seating, uh, seating and shading, and also a uh, poor accessibility for the elderly and disabled. Uh, people. Uh, green cover also was very limited, but now after a uh, reputation, you can see this one by adding boats, uh, uh, ramps, greenery, and uh, improve the accessibility through the additional slopes and uh, handrails here. And um, vegetation improved through all over the bars. More play area was added and rehabilitating the football. A park, small basket uh, cart was a uh, basketball court was added. Materials take into account a formal flooding issue, and there's a small boats around all the uh, the park as using uh, water harvesting. The site number three is the seventh stair, which is located at Badr district in East Amman. It's in a dense area surrounded with many residential homes and stores. The stairs were very bad shape, no railing, poor water drainage causing, causing uh, flooding, and uneven steps for lighting. This the uh, before the, the this is stairs, and now the stairs is after reputation like this. Uh, the intervention was the complete reputation of the stairs, so they easier and more more comfortable to use. Ramps added to help residential here to uh, carry things up and down. Uh, railings are provided in, uh, in order to improve accessibility for the elderly. Uh, planters and stalls improve uh, water drainage runoff. And lighting fixtures was uh, fixed. Uh, blocks were added to, uh, for seating and create a social area where kids also can play. Uh, green walls installed in order to improve uh, to, and to increase the green cover here. Thank you, Sajida. Um, the next step was after that is actually the second baseline assessment. Uh, the, in the second baseline assessment, in addition to evaluating the different uh, focus uh, areas that have been introduced, there was a, a certain walks that have been done by the team and the designing team and greater municipality team to evaluate actually the network that it is better the best uh, approach to provide a network from the available spaces and also to 
discuss the land ownership, the suitability of these spaces uh, in order to select the uh, potential uh, three sites. Uh, 3D assessment has been done, sections and all the assessment for the uh, various locations um, and defining the three potential sites that I've talked about, which is a stairs, a sidewalk next to the park, and uh, one of the urban micro land locations that could be developed further uh, through site activation and uh, practical urbanism. So these are the three extension sites that have been uh, defined through the uh, baseline assessment. This is the stairs uh, that's close to Greater Amman Municipality and uh, the sidewalk next to the Mahmoud Lugda Park that uh, Sajid Dahar has already introduced and uh, the area that is for the urban micro lines, uh, actually Greater Amman Municipality are working on it now, but also we will work on tactical urbanism uh, in the adjacent uh, sidewalk and plaza next to it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about urban micro lines. Uh, how is the time, Karim? Am I still on good terms with the time? You could, you could have seven minutes okay. to go. So I have to actually to rush it. So the urban micro lungs, actually, it is the approach of how to grow the urban forest 10 times faster. And this is an approach for the uh, urban dense areas where we can introduce uh, more greenery and uh, contribution to the uh, biodiversity in the area. So uh, it's a restoration of these strongly degraded areas in the Eastern Amman, and also to contribute in the awareness for both the population and local authorities. The approach that has been done is the Miyawaki method for restoration and reconstruction of natural ecosystems to create ultra dense, highly biodiversity, multi layered forest in this dense urban areas in Amman. So the partners actually that have worked with us, it's the Minister of Environment and Greater Amman Municipality, but also others were involved, involved like Tayun, the Bean, and the Royal Greens. Uh, the approach of Miyawaki actually is to grow a forest 10 times faster and 30 times denser uh, within the urban areas. And it has been done in the two locations in Amman. Um, the whole process was into the site selection and there were site uh, workshops to validate these site selections. Then a community outreach and uh, to site activate and to engage the community and give them little bit of awareness about what is the urban microns and the importance of them, then soil test and analysis, um, species survey and potential natural vegetation research. And then there were workshops and trainings about the natural vegetation, then defining the plant community and procurement of these native species, uh, soil engineering, and then plantation and mulching. And uh, there was a training about also the maintenance of such forests and then the forest themselves uh, and their maintenance. So these are the two locations um, where actually they were more uh, of, uh, let's say, more arid uh, and they, were, uh, they didn't have any vegetation. And then when they were planted and uh, in two years, but there are other locations that we saw in five years, really it's a forest. Uh, and it has uh, decreased the noise uh, and pollution and the air pollution and so on. Um, Sajida, do you want to talk about this yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, I will talk uh, very quick, but uh, something to add it regarding the Miyawaki method, it was tested before in India and Pakistan and uh, Europe, but now in Middle East, uh, Amman is the first city that have been implemented uh, this method. Uh, for the Greater Amman municipality, uh, you know that uh, Amman is capital of Jordan with population more than 9 million, more than 40% of the population in uh, within GAM, and the area of uh, 800 square meter divided to 22 administrative uh, district. Our Greater Amman municipality committed to make a city healthy, livable city, and make their commitment on the national level and the international level. A man is um, a member of the C40 uh, 
uh, network and uh, climate uh, leadership group, 100 regions and cities, and the combat of the mayors. A man is leader on climate uh, change uh, uh, action to minimize the negative impacts of the climate change and work to reduce the emission by uh, 30% uh, by 2030 and to be um, neutral by uh, 2050. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It is target to a reduction in forty percent of the greenhouse gas emission by twenty thirty. Okay, and now actually for the publication because also the publication is a very important part through the capacity building that has been a, a major indicator of the project with the different partners, but also to contribution of the national and regional agendas. Um, the publications, actually, we have a, a, a guidebook on the plan selection. Hopefully, the, the launching will be uh, by the end of October, and it's in Arabic and English. Uh, we have published a public space and gender in Amman uh, publication, and there is another one. It's actually a guidebook and a manual for the urban micro uh, and it has already been published and distributed also to the various uh, stakeholders who are engaged in such a thing and whoever is interested, uh, it's available. Also, uh, we have published uh, the Amman from gray to green and urban social engagement, but also we have two publications based on also what Sajda has presented. We have the social benefits of green infrastructure, the environmental benefits of green infrastructure. They are both in English and Arabic. We are working currently on the strategic paper and hopefully it will be published uh, uh, next year. It's about uh, the green infrastructure and also some infographics about uh, green infrastructure. In addition, actually, to mainstreaming the green infrastructure now into the uh, national agendas and on the um, plans of the various stakeholders that we're working uh, with. This is just a quick view that I can share with you. Regarding the cash flow work, now if you can see, it's a different approach. It's more of uh, actually approaching the uh, different ecosystems that uh, are in Jordan. So the work has been done actually on the rehabilitation of the ecosystems in uh, eight reserves in Jordan: uh, Mujer, Bajlun, Dana, uh, Fefa, Azraq, Shomeri, Dibin, and uh, and a special conservation area which is Wadi Gharaba in the Jordan Valley. Also, we worked on uh, agriculture and community. So uh, lots of agricultural activities has been conducted with the uh, Natural Center for Research, uh, Agricultural Research Center. Uh, let's say uh, different types of agriculture, uh, including the uh, organic farming systems and teaching the workers and the community how to do these farmings. Yeah, ecotourism also in some of the reserves that we have done in Mujab, Ajlun, Dibin, Fefa, and in Azraq. Uh, also some improvement in the public spaces. Uh, they vary between parks, sometimes the streetscapes like in Fefa village, one of the most poverty stricken areas uh, in, in Jordan. And Umm al it's an archeological park uh, that lots of work has been conducted there. Uh, the approach actually also focused on the reuse of recycle and reduce of the plastic and concrete. So they have created urban furniture from uh, reused materials. We encouraged the uh, uh, reviving of the traditional weaving and utilizing these weaving as shared structures and the creation of also the tiling from local materials uh, into the designs of the uh, work. This is an example of the Azraq wetland that has dried uh, to a certain extent in a very uh, sad and severe way. Uh, they were managed to reclaim 10% of the water that was taken from uh, the reserve by working through the cash workers. Uh, we have created new water surfaces that were beneficial for certain fish breeds and certain uh, types of migrating birds. Uh, also, there were activities like uh, the creation of ecological gardens that had the uh, both purposes of, uh, or actually more purposes of recreation and social uh, and environmental. And we have the bee hotels and the uh, different type of types of plants and uh, their um, uh, availability and it's more focused on local uh, plants, but also educational because these ecological gardens are open for schools for educational purposes. Um, and 
here also it's how they are developed in several locations in Jordan. And that's all from our side. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Rowan. I don't know which part of this project I like better. I, I like the surgical interventions and tactical interventions. I like the network you created between them, the integration with the Great Amal Municipality Climate Map, and also the outreach. Um, I think I think that's uh, that's fantastic work and the guidance that you're providing for others to to pursue this uh, in other in other locations as well. So I, I think some of us might steal a feather from your caps uh, using those publications and, uh, and and try and apply those elsewhere. And I, I hope that's the goal. Um, so, so thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a couple of questions. I think the first question is for uh, Dr. Amir. Uh, it's how do we reconcile protecting the environment and social justice? How can we ensure more climate justice? Uh, this also means that the vulnerable groups are not um, pushed to the outskirts of the city and only the rich can afford to live in the city center. So that everyone has equal access to green spaces. Is there really an either or question or is there a middle way? All right, thank you, Karim. Um, if we go back to the last slide I shared, it's, it's very hypothetical, but it brings up that question. And I think there's no one solution fit all. And it changes a lot based on the context and based on lots of uh, the level of community engagement. So those who are making decisions, whether they are planners or government officials or need to take into account the underrepresented communities and marginalized communities um, and make sure to have as much possible balance between large open green spaces or green infrastructure that would allow the ecosystem to restore and help itself recover, but also have reasonable distribution of uh, public spaces to be accessible to different socioeconomic classes in the community. And um, I don't think there is one. So what could work in the West might not work in, in the East. And so it, there's no one answer but it does, the scale changes a lot and vary a lot. Where are we talking about? So I think it's a good question. It's important to point out a specific region and then a case by case would be the ideal answer. I don't know if that answers your question. I just suppose it does. It, it all depends on it's on a case by case basis. Uh, the second right. question here is for Dima. Uh, when talking about Zuhur Area Triangle, obviously a road safety audit is required in order to make sure that the vulnerable road users known, known as pedestrians are safe. Uh, does UN Habitat include the road safety audit as one of its criteria for implementing these projects? Uh, Dima, do you have a response to that? Yeah, thank you so much, Karim. Actually, um, safety audit was not included as part of um, selecting the site. We have actually started with 120 sites and then we zoomed in, into three locations and then um, with Amman municipality we decided to go with this as a whole area. Um, uh, we did not do that because eventually the site should not act like a public space. It's still an intersection within main roads. So um, uh, a safety audit was not included but um, we could we could actually uh, ask a man uh, municipality specifically the road uh, department uh, we have already asked them to uh, add a traffic light next to the site because we believe that at the beginning a lot of people might be interested to visit the site and uh, there's also also a crossway um, between two two roads so yeah, and pedestrian crossing way should be added uh, next to the site, but that will be after we implement the project. Great. I think I think the question was really wasn't really a question. I think they were telling us that there should be an audit. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so I think we'll yeah. we'll we'll, we'll take that uh, on board. Um, mm -hmm. th 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 thanks for asking that. Uh, th I think this is all the questions that we have so far. Um, I think I had seen a hand up at one point. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, we can, if you're allowed to. Um, no, there's no, no, there's no more hands on, uh, up at the moment. But if you have any more questions, we have nine minutes um, to, uh, to any questions our speakers. We have nine minutes to take questions. Uh, if not, we will end after an hour and a half so, uh, and give them some rest because uh, we've been talking for a while. Um, 
any any extra comments while we wait for uh, for extra for questions to come in? Um, we've heard very varying points of view. Amir, do you have any reflections on uh, on the projects that you had seen, for example, uh, that resonate with other projects that you've seen in other regions, perhaps? What 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 strikes me about the um, about many of projects that we've seen is obviously Amman is, is drier than other locations in, around the world. So perhaps the role of vegetation uh, in other places uh, is different from the role of vegetation here. And uh, the blue green balance, if you like, is different from what we would find elsewhere. So do you have any, do you have any instant, uh, I don't want to put you on the, on the spot, but. Well, uh, no, 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 of course. I, first I'm very impressed with Amman, um, a city I've visited about 25 times and I claim I know it well. Um, I'm very impressed by the efforts. And I was wondering if our colleagues from Amman can tell us if these efforts are driven by um, the need for the water, because I'm, even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the need was there already. So when, when did the balance, when did the mindset change? Is it a political will? Is it a royal decree? Is it bottom up? Is it the community getting together and forcing the election or elected people who are environmentally conscious? Is it the international community you have being UN Habitat and GIZ bringing in this and the government is taking it? So where did the shift happen? Because Amman always had USAID and GIZ and Habitat for the last 30 years, but seeing these projects, I'm very impressed. We don't have that similar. Well, we, we, well we, have, we have the great Amman municipality uh, representative here to tell us exactly when that happened mm -hmm. in the decision-making process. So Sajida, would you like to tell us how yeah. did that happen? Yeah. And when, I, when did it happen? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Amir. But I will go back first to the first question to add some comments regarding the um, community gathering and the level of the gathering on all, on all level. We have uh, do our best to engage the NGOs around this um, site to engage also the refugees without distinguish between the residential and the uh, refugees. Uh, uh, the woman also uh, needs the kids. So we meet, we also make like a separate uh, activity for each group and try to reflect all their needs by the uh, co-design. Uh, the, the second question is, you, you can see now uh, all the world, the globe talking about the climate change. So as a greater Amman municipality commitment and to be part of a lot of uh, a global network and uh, to fulfill their commitments, we do our best to uh, reflect or uh, uh, this action on the long term and the short term to do uh, our best uh, to um, uh, to do our climate action plan and uh, one of the success key to fulfill our commitments is uh, by international cooperation with uh, with this connection so uh, this is what happened since uh, let's say after signature of paris uh, agreement on the national and international level thank you great Th thank you very much so uh... There was a, a changing point, perhaps, uh, uh, when, the, when the local climate action plan started coming in, uh, as well as obviously the alignment with C40 and resilient cities and global compacts. So I think I think this is perhaps when the, when when the momentum started shifting um, in Amman. Uh, okay, I think we're mostly done here. So unless anyone has any uh, burning questions uh, within within the audience or any of the speakers want to put their hands up to say anything else? I think we would, uh, yep, saw you there. <laughs> okay, I'm raising my hand. Um, actually, it's also worth uh, Dr. Amir to uh, mention that uh, during the assessment and also working on the Amman master plan, it has been highlighted actually the need also of public open spaces. And with the COVID, uh, problem, this has been highlighted actually more and more uh, for health reasons and for uh, social reasons. Now, the main main problem in the availability of these public spaces and their suitability is actually the land ownership that we have in Amman. Uh, this is a, a major problem that actually is a problem and, and a handicap for the land use. So really they cannot designate all these public spaces on privately owned lands. Uh, the topography of the area, the now with the climate change also and the 
flash floods of rains that are happening, one of the major problems in Amman is that it's focusing on building and engineering solutions. And these engineering solutions, they really they're not allowing permeability of the land to absorb the water. So it's running from the hills, Amman is on seven hills, it's running up from the hills to the downtown, flooding the downtown. So these are the needs they're highlighted. Now you need also some support in providing because Greater Amman Municipality has lots of challenges. So our role actually and the inhabited role is to support Greater Amman Municipality either by providing financial means or also through the integration and mainstreaming of certain solutions. So uh, let's say the focus of the projects that we were working on, uh, some of them are rehabilitation of parks, but also we want to provide a palette of affordable environmental solutions. And these, if they are provided and uh, embedded within these institutions, then uh, I hope that actually we're gonna see a more reflect of uh, the work because at the end, GIZ projects, they end, UN Habitat funding and the uh, uh, projects, they end and they move to another uh, thing. So actually the sustainability of these works is through Greater Amman Municipality and the Minister of Environment and the various municipality. And we're very lucky actually to have a very de dedicated and passionate uh, partner about Greater Amman that has facilitated our work and really created uh, lots of uh, ownership. Great, thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, both for this uh, lovely ending to the conversation. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers one more time, Dr. Amir, Sajida, and Rawan for, for this wonderful, and sorry, and Dima, she, she, she's not on my screen for some reason. And uh, uh, Dima for their wonderful uh, presentations. I uh, really enjoyed them. And uh, I think we've all learned quite a bit about green infrastructure. So hopefully we could have another one next year and uh, have an update on the state of green infrastructure uh, in the MENA region, perhaps with other regional examples that would have copied uh, our man's model and, and learned from it. So uh, once again, thanks for our speakers and thanks for the great questions uh, from our audience who bore for us, who bore with us for the last hour and 40 minutes. So uh, thank you everyone. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you everyone. Just before you leave, one second. <laughs> We're not <Yeah>. leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Kiri, you just want to shut me off. I'm not going to. Wait. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to ask for a favor, please. For those who can actually open their cameras, can you please? Because I just want to have one picture with some faces, if that's possible. Um, that would do be have, great. Do we have, have to smile? Yes, of course. <laughs> and um, if, I, if I also... Uh, can kindly ask you in, in the official Sustainable Cities uh, platform, let's take a break in case you want to have your virtual coffee with, 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 with us. That would be also great. And just take a, um, like a stroll there and, and just get to know with the interface. Thank you so much. Big smiles, everyone. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, thank you. Okay, perfect. I love it. Thank you. Enjoy your coffee. Thank everyone. you. Bye and bye. we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.
floor is yours, Ayman. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ayman Smadi. I'm the director of the UITP office in Dubai, responsible for the Middle East and North Africa region. It gives me great pleasure uh, to facilitate uh, this session. Um, I was chatting with my friend Dina from FES that this is probably the easiest job because we have such fantastic speakers and I feel honored really to be present as a facilitator for this session. We decided uh, to keep this session very lively and very informal and interactive. Uh, so uh, it relies on interventions, short interventions and some follow-up uh, questions and answers that have not been prepared. I can say honestly that we, we don't have a script. Uh, we just touched on some, some main themes. Um, and like I said, the whole idea of the session is to discuss inclusive sustainable urban mobility. And I think uh, this could mean different things for different people, but maybe there's one line that summarizes it all, which is no one uh, left behind. I think that's the whole idea of having effective, sustainable urban mobility, that we are uh, addressing the needs, um, the accessibility needs of all users of urban mobility. And of course, when we speak about urban mobility, public transport is at the core uh, of that mobility. And I think the word public uh, came for a reason, that it is open for everyone. So uh, in the next 85 minutes, I guess, uh, that we have, uh, we will hear from the different panelists uh, their views on, on how they see uh, this inclusivity uh, accomplished in the region. We will also learn about their own experiences because I think there are connotations about gender, for instance, especially gender in our region, uh, about being able to be in leadership positions as well as be able to comfortably and safely uh, use public transportation. So. I am extremely happy to, to have such a panel today that addresses the various aspects of, of sustainable urban mobility. And for the sake of time, um, I, I, I will not do introductions, but in, uh, what I will do is ask each panelist to say a little bit about themselves. They are all good friends, by the way. I feel very fortunate uh, that I know them all. I interacted with them all. Uh, some more than others, but we will not reveal age at this point, uh, especially uh, for me. Huh? Um, so uh, I, if you allow me to start, I would like to go to uh, Her Excellency Engineer Wissam Tahtamoni. Uh, Engineer Wissam, I know from the days when uh, the Land Transport Regulatory uh, Commission was established, and before that maybe it was called PTRC. Um, and now as a secretary general of the Ministry of Transport, she is the technocrat, if you will. She is the stable position within the ministry that ensures policies and strategies are carried through. And so I think she brings a phenomenal experience by dealing with the regulatory agency and now dealing at the highest national level, setting national policy for, for mobility and transport in general. Um, to, to share with us, you know, some, some ideas, uh, some maybe thoughts uh, about how she sees, um, at least from her perspective in Jordan, uh, how are we dealing with this inclusivity from various aspects, whether it is different user groups, whether it is male, female, old, young, uh, physically able to physically with, with limitations. And of course, uh, Engineer Wissam, if you don't mind to say a few things about yourself, especially the university where you graduated, because that's yeah. my Thank ultimate. You. Thank you. Thank you, my friend, uh, Dr. Ayman. Thank you, uh, all my colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Wissam Tahtamoni. Uh, I have a master's degree from uh, Jordan University of Science and Technology in Civil, uh, civil Engineering. Uh, I joined the Ministry of Transport in 1999 as a transport economist. Then uh, when Land Transport Regularity Commission, uh, which was Public Transport Regularity Commission, was established, we moved there. Uh, and we work uh, on, uh, on uh, this uh, commission uh, after it was uh, um, uh, changed to be a Land Transport Regularity Commission. I worked there about uh, 19 years uh, from uh, 19 uh, from 2000 until 
2019. Then I moved to the Ministry of Transport as a Secretary General. Uh, this uh, experience was mainly in public transport uh, sector. It, uh, it is related to studies, research, and regulations of public transport sectors. Um, for me, uh, um, uh, we work on uh, issues regarding uh, disabled people, regarding safety and security for women in uh, terminals. We have studies, re uh, research uh, about uh, what are the obstacles for women to use public transport services. Mainly, uh, they were uh, concerning safety and security. Also, the uh, for disabled elderly and uh, for women pregnant uh, women women with children uh, there were the uh, standard of buses it, it was a main obstacle so uh, this is about me my experience in in uh, a few words and uh, uh, thank you again for this opportunity to talk about uh, the plans and the projects that we are executing in the ministry of transport and our commissions regarding uh, enhancing public transport services. I, uh, I have uh, certain words to say uh, about uh, this, uh, this topic. And uh, uh, I have uh, only 15 uh, minutes because I have another meeting. So uh, allow me to, uh, I will leave the, the meeting after this, uh, 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 this speech. Thank you. The Ministry of Transport, in cooperation with its main partners and related bodies, seeks to develop public transport system in Jordan and re reduce the time and cost, as well as increase safety, security, and reli reliability standards, and uh, which to influence the economic, political, and social participation of women and take into account aspects related to the elderly, uh, disabled people, school students, and university students. In light of rapid increase in demand for passenger transport in Jordan due to the immigration and uh, population and economic growth in Jordan and in the region, as main indicator of the transport sector indicates an increase in portion of family spending of income on transportation by 31% and the low rate of women economic participation in labor market, which is not exceeding 18%. This uh, is a very uh, crucial indicator because we have a, a higher education rate among women, uh, but if we uh, compare them with the uh, participation in labor market, it's not like that. However, to improve the quality of public transport services, we introduce uh, many uh, projects. The first one is the uh, code of content user, uh, code of conduct users for users, operators, and workers. Uh, this uh, code of contact, we work with Sahar, I think, Sahar, yes, she worked with us on it, aims to control the harassment and discrimination against women and provide mechanism to express public opinion on uh, uh, to report any violation of the code of conduct and performance indicators to monitor progress. Also, a MOU was signed between Ministry of Transport and Sadaka Foundation, okay, aims to find a common national framework and to unify efforts to work on overcoming the obstacles of public transportation to women entering the labor market, raising their participation in the sector and improve women's experience of mobility and reduce time and cost and enhance security and safety. Ministry of Transport with other entities, related entities like GAM and Land Transport Regularity Commission uh, work to provide efficient, reliable, and regular frequency transport network through implementation and operation of PRT systems in Amman and between main cities. Now we have a project between Amman and Zarga, and uh, we are uh, studying the opportunities uh, for other cities like Salt to have the network in place. 
Also, we are replacing the old fleet with a new one, uh, uh, taking into consideration the standards level of the, and the specification of vehicles to be friendly for women and elderly and disabled people. The Ministry of Transport also is reviewing the national strategy. Now we are working in reviewing our national strategy of transport uh, to attach the great importance of, to develop packages of projects that take into account school and university students and create safe and appropriate transportation facilities. In addition to include environmental dimension, and road safety dimension for the proposed project and program packages. We are working on uh, ITS system. Uh, also, we are working on um, uh, introducing electrical vehicles in the fleet uh, uh, and other projects. Uh, regarding my own experience as a woman in this position, I, ha I think that uh, I am in a position better position of understanding the woman needs, okay, in transport and to understand what is uh, the main obstacles and uh, how to increase uh, the, uh, the space for women in this sector. Also, uh, uh, I can understand more what are the needs of the mothers in this sector, what they need for their children, uh, like students, uh, the transport for students, the transport for uh, elderly people. Um, and uh, I think uh, the topic we are talking about is very important. And, uh, and I want you uh, to thank all of you for listening to me. And I am ready to, to have any question because of time now, if you, <laughs> if you <laughs> need to ask me anything <laughs> before I leave. Thank you. Thank you very much, Engineer Wissam, for these comments. Uh, maybe I can uh, just follow up with a couple of questions and then I will uh, ask the panel yeah. if they have uh, other questions. Uh, so um, if, we, if I can take your, your last remark about, uh, you know, being a woman in a leadership position and, and you know, being more sensitive to, to the needs, for instance, of female users of public transportation. Um, do you see that there is a buy-in, you know, because, you know, sometimes in the plan it's okay, but in terms of buy-in and actually, uh, you know, creating something tangible uh, for the user, how do you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, I, I will answer it uh, now. Um, uh, as plans, you can put anything in the plan, but you need to, to put it on the ground for the people. For uh, uh, you put uh, uh, the problem and you search for the plan to, to solve this problem. Uh, we have a research that was being made and uh, it results that uh, one of the reasons women say that uh, we don't use, uh, we, we are not going to work because the, uh, uh, the uh, wages that we take, we spend more of it on the uh, transportation cost from home to work and other vi uh, vice versa. So we take this as a, a, as a hint that we need to subsidize this uh, tariff for women, for low-income people. And uh, we start uh, working on a, a, a subsidies, a subsidy uh, schemes for these segments. Uh, in order to implement these subsidies, we need uh, the infrastructure and the tools to implement uh, these subsidies. So we are working on, uh, on introducing uh, um, a fair collecting system in buses uh, to be able to subsidize segments of people like poor people, like uh, disabled people, elderly people. Also, we have a result that uh, we are not safe in the terminals, okay? In the night, we don't have lights in the terminal. So we, are, uh, we work on uh, rehabilitation and constructing of new terminals that have all security uh, measures and the standards. Uh, we have a problem also in uh, the specification of buses. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't have accessible uh, 
uh, easy to access. So we uh, work on the standards of buses to be able to access for disabled people, for mothers with uh, their children, for elderly people. These are some examples on how we make it on the ground. But I think that it's a long journey. Maybe we are in start of that and taking into consideration the, uh, the financial constraints also to enhance the, uh, the whole regime. But we are working and uh, many of our friends on, uh, on uh, uh, the uh, fancy, uh, uh, IFC and uh, EBRT are helping us, uh, also GIZ. We have uh, these entities with us also. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very good answer. Um, if I can ask you a quick question, um, uh, is it allowed by law in Jordan to have female drivers uh, of buses a taxi? I know there was uh, uh, a pink taxi, I, I'm not even sure if it's still operational in Amman, but in terms of, uh, you know, extending this uh, wider in, in public transportation services, is there something yeah. in the law that prevents it? Or, and, and the other question is, no. are there plans? Yeah, okay. We don't have any uh, anything in law that prevents female from entering this market. On the contrary, we are happy uh, to have uh, female working on uh, student uh, buses. Uh, this is very good for uh, families to feel safe for their kids uh, with a bus that is drive by a female. Um, we, uh, we don't have any obstacles, but maybe uh, we need to aware women of, uh, of this uh, opportunities to work, like in taxi. Uh, we don't have the bank taxi still yet. We don't have it. But it's, uh, we have uh, some uh, women now working on uh, the Uber and Kareem uh, vehicles. We have them. And uh, also in uh, uh, Talabat, okay, to, uh, uh, yes, it's uh, new, but it's there now. And it is good, very good. And we encourage women to uh, work on this sector, like in uh, the uh, student buses, it's very, very, uh, nice and uh, they have opportunities to work there. Excellent. Uh, because we, we see in markets, especially where uh, you have female operators, it, it's more conducive to encouraging, you know, the same segment of users and even, but more importantly, university, university creating uh, a calmer environment, a more disciplined in, environment. So I'm very pleased to hear, uh, you know, some of these positive developments. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, do you like Engineer Wissam? Because I know you have to go. Do you like to make any final comments uh, before you have to run to your meeting? Thank you, my friend. And thank you all ladies and uh, all the audience uh, with us. And uh, I uh, hope that you have a very uh, uh, good uh, and uh, truthful uh, 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 conversation and uh, any recommendations and any uh, outcomes of this workshop. I like uh, if you can share it with us so as to take it into consideration in our plans. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you so much. Have a and nice good day. Luck. Good luck in your meeting. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. All right, thanks. Uh, so I mean, we heard from you know the, a national perspective, and it happens to be in Jordan. And I think you know some of this is, is similar in the region. If, if it's okay by my colleagues on the panel, if we go to Sahar, since you know we sort of complement the you know the Jordan story, since Her Excellency spoke about Sadaqa and the work that that Sahar did. So I, I turn it over to you, Sahar. Shukran uh, jazilan. دكتور وانا سعيدة اني اكون موجودة بيناتكم اليوم على هذا هاي المنصة وبين نساء ورجال يعني كفؤين وكفؤات وفي هذا النطاق اشتغلت مع العديد منكم وسريعا انا بتذكر انك كنت طالب منا هيك مقدمة سريعة مش رح اطيل انا اسمي سهر العلول انا عضوة فريق اداري وعضوة فريق مؤسس في مؤسستي اسمها صداقة 
واحنا بنشتغل على الحقوق الاقتصاديه للنساء في سوق العمل وتحديدا على ازاله المعيقات الهيكليه اللي ذكرت بعض منهم عطوفه وسام التهتموني قبل قليل اللي على راسها عدم توفر منظومه نقل عام امنه وفاعله وثاني عقبه هي عدم توفر الحضانات وهذا يتعلق بالعبء الرعائي غير مدفوع الاجر اللي بتتحمله النساء وايضا عدم تكافؤ الاجور او تدنيها وهي المعيقات الثلاثه مع الاسف كثير مرات يا يعني اما بتكون فرديه للمراه ولكن معظم الاوقات تتزاوج وبالتالي اصبحت عقبه اساسيه في هذه العقبات وخلت ارقامنا مع الاسف للمشاركه الاقتصاديه للنساء في الاردن لم تتعدى حاجز ال 14% في العقد الاخير. بالرغم ايضا من النسبه كبيره من النساء خريجات وحملت درجات جامعيه بنسبه يمكن 62 ل 64% حملت بكالوريوس لكن هذا لا يترجم على ارض الواقع وبالتالي في حاجة لمؤسسة مثل مؤسستنا أنها تكون مؤسسة مجتمع مدني حاملة هذا الملف وبالفعل إحنا من 2010 موجودين على الساحة وملفنا الأساسي كان العمل على تطبيق المادة 72 من قانون العمل المتعلقة بالحضانات المؤسسية في مكان العمل ونجحنا مؤخراً بتعديل قانون العمل من ضمنهم هاي المادة لم تعد فقط للنساء صارت للأمهات والأباء حقهم في حضانة مؤسسية في مكان عملهم أو أحد نماذجها وأيضا عدلنا مواد أخرى متعلقة بإجازة الأبو والعمل المرن ولكن يمكن هاي الأمور لها مساحة ثانية رح نركز اليوم يمكن في حديثنا شوي عن النقل وهاي كعقبة أساسية تمنع 47% من النساء في الأردن من دخول سوق العمل ضعف هذه المنظومة ف 47% عزفنا عن قبول وظيفة هذا ما أظهرته دراسة إحنا عملناها مع الـ FES بال2016 وكانت يعني مش إنها مفاجأة يمكن لكن الواحد لما بيشوف الرقم قدامه بتصير إنها حاجة ملحة لوجودنا اليوم إحنا مع بعض وأيضاً للتداخلات اللي عملنا بنشتغلها بشكل مباشر مع وزارة النقل ذكرت المهندسة وسام على التعاون بين مؤسستنا وبين وزارة النقل لدينا مذكرة تفاهم من خلالها طورنا إطار وطني للنقل العام من منظور النوع الاجتماعي أو من منظور المرأة المستخدمة بقدر أحكي عنه بالتفصيل فيما بعد بدك أدخل بمداخلتي أو أعمل مقدمة بعد ذلك ولا بتحب تسألني دكتور إذا ما عندك مانع بعطيك بريك تشربي مي أو قهوة <تصفيق> <تصفيق> وربما أنا مش عارف أحول عربي والإنجليزي نروح للملازم خديجة بعد إذنك أنا بدي أرجع أسألك عن لأنه هاي الأرقام بتضلها صادمة إلي بالرغم أني أنا برضو اشتغلت على هذا الحكي قبل سنوات لأنه عم نحكي تقريبا على النصف هذا وخلينا نرجع نشوف مشان احط براسك الافكار اللي رح نحكي عنها ان شاء الله بالفولو اب عن انه هل هي نقص بالانفراستراكشر ولا هو اتيتيود خلينا نشوف نحللها شوي لما نرجع لك. لوتيننت خريجه ذيس از ا نايس اكشلي يعني ترانزيشن انه هير وي هاف ان ايجنسي ويتش از ا بارتنر ويز اس فور يو اي تي بي مينا ذات ديلز برايمرلي ويز ترانسبورت سكيورتي امن المواصلات ات از كولد So it's a very nice name, um, and it's an experiment that we are trying to, to uh, extend in the region to learn from, from this success story. Uh, so Lieutenant Khadija agreed to be with us. Uh, we thank her very much to, to share, you know, how having such an entity, such as uh, Amd al-Muasalat, Department of Transport Security, how does that reflect on creating an inclusive uh, environment for sustainable urban mobility, as well as more importantly, her own experience. How is she enabled as a woman in a leadership position? Uh, she has a lot of people who salute her every day. She's a lieutenant in a, in a position of responsibility, responsible for, for security stuff in the field and administratively. So without further ado, um, Lieutenant Khadija, if you can introduce yourself a little bit and a little bit about maybe Uh, DTS about the Department of Transport Security. Thank you.
ميوتد زي مشكلتي <تصفيق> We still don't hear you. Ma'am, this mic. So can you listen to me now? Good, yes, yes. okay. So the issue with the mic. So uh, hi everyone, thank you, Dr. Ayman. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and excuse me, everyone. I will speak in Arabic. It's, it's, it's more comfortable for me uh, and to make sure that I have the clear information for everyone. So, معكم خديجة محمد الحمادي الملازم خديجة محمد الحمادي من أمن المواصلات في شرطة دبي سعيدا يتواجد ضمن المتحدثين الموجودين اليوم معانا ونتحدث عن دور النساء في أمن المواصلات وفي تأمين هذا القطاع سواء كان للنساء أو لكافة شرائح المجتمع رح أعطي نبدة مثل ما طلب مني دكتور أيمن عن أمن المواصلات المواصلات جهة أمنية تابعة لشرطة دبي مهامها تأمين قطاع النقل والمواصلات في إمارة دبي الشريان الحي والإمارة دبي من محطات المترو والترام والحافلات وسيارات الأجرة وتقديم الدعم الفني والأمني في حال حدوث أي أزمة أو طارئ التأمين يكون من خلال الكوادر الأمنية عندنا من الرجال والنساء الأكفاء والأنظمة الأمنية المتطورة والحديثة اللي تم يتم تبنيها من فترة الأخرى في إدارة أمن المواصلات وإدارة أمن المواصلات أيضا تعزز الأمن والحماية والسلامة لإمارة دبي مع كافة الأجهزة الأمنية والشرطية الموجودة في إمارة دبي هذه نبذة مختصرة ومتى ما حبيت دكتور أيمن أبدأ وأنطلق عن جزئيتي أنا رأي أبدأ إن شاء الله تفضلي تفضلي بما أنه you have the floor وصوتك واضح تفضلي تمام شكرا جزيلا ف... نرح نبدأ أولاً عن قصة الكوادر الأمنية النسائية نحن الكوادر الأمنية النسائية الموجودين في قطاع النقل والمواصلات هي أول قصة في المنطقة وأتوقع ما زلنا نحن أول قصة في المنطقة منفردين حتى الآن في تأمين المحطات المترو والترام والحافلات على الرغم من التحديات الكبيرة المتمثلة في هذا القطاع لأن قطاع, الأم... قطاع المواصلات مش قطاع ثابت ما فيها ما فيها رتم ثابت فيه رتم سريع فيها ديمومة حركة فيها نشاط دائم قطاع المواصلات فيها جمهور كبير متعدد الجنسيات وفي إمارة دبي عن متعددين الجنسيات متعددين اللغات ثقافات متنوعة هذا روحه أيضا تحدي لله الحمد قادرين نحن نتجاوزها إلى جانب محطات المترو عندنا والترام والحافلات مرتبطة بعدد كبير من المناطق الحيوية ومناطق سكانية فيها كثافة سكانية كبيرة ومدارس ومستشفيات وجامعات بالتالي من المرتادين يكونون في هذه المحطات من النساء والأطفال والعوائل وطلاب المدارس هنا يكمن أهمية دور المرأة في أمن المواصلات لماذا؟ أنا ما أعتبر هذا تحيز لكن واقع ملموس شهدنا بأنفسنا من زميلات عمل في الميدان وأثناء تواجدنا الحين أيضا في الميدان بين بعض من فئات المجتمع اللي ذكرناهم من الأمهات من النساء من الأطفال طلاب المدارس دائما ينجذبون للعنصر التأمين النسائي دون تحيز هذا واقع وجربنا فيتوجهون له يتوجهون للمرأة لطرح سؤال استفسار أو رفع الشكوى وابداء ملاحظة أو حتى مجرد أن يلقون السلام علينا فالمرأة في أمن المواصلات ذكرتها أنا قبل هي لا تكمل عمل الرجل بل هي تقوم بما يقوم به الرجل بشكل كامل على أرض الميدان غير الجمهور اللي لازم المرأة تتعامل معهم عنا بعد أيضا العاملات في محطات المترو نفسهم أو محطات الحافلات والترام العاملات من شركات التشغيل شركات التنظيف عاملات حتى في المحلات التجارية عدد من النساء يتواجد في المحطة غير الكادر النسائي الأمني الموجود هذه يعني مجموعة النساء الموجودات في المحطة لابد أن يكون موجود هناك أنصر تأمين لهم قناة تواصل معهم لتأمين البيئة المناسبة لهم صحيح هم يشتغلون في شركاتهم يشتغلون في أماكنهم لكن كنا نحن في نطاق وفي إطار واحد فلا بد من توطيد هذه العلاقات 
ونحن دائما نوجه كوادرنا ايضا النسائيه سواء نسائيه ورجاليه بان يكون يبنون هذه العلاقات مع الزملاء الاخرين على ارض الميدان في المحطات المترو، وكنساء مهم جدا ايضا من خلال عندنا عدد من مبادرات وفعاليات مجتمعيه على في على ارض الواقع في الميدان مناسبات وطنيه ايام عالميه مثل يوم السعاده يوم المراه يكون فيها فرق مشتركة واحتفال مشترك ما بينهم وأنا أعتبر هذا جزء جدا مهم لأن مع تطور الأنظمة الأمنية وبرامج الأمنية وكافة التطور راح نوصل العلاقات الاجتماعية مهمة جدا راح نتدارك فيها الكثير الكثير من المشاكل المستقبلية وأيضا من النقاط اللي حبيت أذكرها لأن نحن إدارة المواصلات انتبهنا أن هذه العلاقات مهمة خاصة لنطاق النساء أدخلنا مجموعة كبيرة من النساء والكوادر الأمنية لدورات أمنية وتثقيفية مثل لغة الجسد والحس الأمني والتعامل مع الجمهور وكان لهم أيضا جزء في السيناريوهات الأمنية العديدة اللي تتم لرفع من كفاءة الكادر الأمني في إمارة دبي والآن أنا أستطيع قول بكل فخر بأن المرأة في أمن المواصلات هي لا تعتبر عنصر تأمين فقط لأن سواء المرأة أو رجل إذا وضعنا في إطار تأميني فقط نحن راح نجرد من الإنسانية دامنا هو موجود في محطة مترو في تفاعل جمهور في ديمومة حركة لابد أن يكون إطارة يكون في ملتزم أيضا بعلاقات اجتماعية ويكون عنده هذا الحس الاجتماعي وأنه يتعرف على يكون عنده هذه العلاقات مع الجمهور سواء أو العمال فصارت المرأة في أمن المواصلات أكبر من مجرد أنها تكون عنصر تأمين هي مصدر معرفة للجمهور هي وجه وطني سياحي أيضا لرواد المحطة هي مرجع ثقة لنساء المحطة والعاملات فيها وحب أوضح أيضا عن دور اجتماعي توعوي قامت به عدد من نساء أمن المواصلات من ورش تثقيفية أمنية توعوية لمرتادي قطاع النقل والمواصلات من طلاب المدارس والجامعات آخر تلك الورش كانت قصة تم تصميمها لأطفال لذوي الهمم ممن يرتادون وسائل النقل والمواصلات القصة كانت بعنوان أنتم في أمان كتابة القصة وتنفيذها وتصميمها كانت مناسبة لفئة ذوي الهمم ولعوائلهم كان الهدف منهم تعريفهم بهم الإجراءات اللي أو الخطوات اللي مفروض يسوونها في حال أن تعرضوا لأي خطر أو أزمة في أثناء المواصلات ودورنا نحن اللي موجود داعم وساند لهم والمرأة على أرض العمل الميداني مثل ما قلنا تشابه الرجل في الاختصاصات والواجبات والمسؤوليات وتملك المميزات والإمكانيات اللي يجعلها في المناصب الإشرافية والتنفيذية ونحن نملك أيضا نساء في فرق مكافحة الشغب وفرق تخصصية مثل الكيناين إلى جانب نساء في غرفة العمليات ومراكز الاتصال الموحد اللي يتواصل مع الجمهور خلال 24 ساعة هذه الخطوات كلها كانت الهدف منها استدامة الأمن والأمان في المحطات واستدامة حركة التنقل والمواصلات في الإمارة لكافة شرائح المجتمع هذه جزئيتي أشكر لكم حسن استماعكم نرجع الميكروفون للدكتور أيمن إذا عندك أي سؤال استاذي شكرا كفيتي ووفيتي ملازمة خديجة ما شاء الله بعدين بحب أتشارك مع جمهورنا أنه ما شاء الله بدبي الحوادث اللي بتصير او الانسدنس بسموها ريبورتد زيرو صفر فالحمد لله يعني هذه الجهود وربما هلا بس نسمع من كانتال بنرجع بالمتابعه انه العوامل المختلفه من وجود العنصر النسائي لوجود الانظمه والتقنيات التواصل مع مع المستخدمين التواصل مع العاملين الثانيين يعني توسيع قاعده الشراكه بالمحطات وما الى ذلك كل هذا الحكي بسهم بخلق بيئه امنه انه بدبي ما في امرأة أو حدا صغير طالب أو طالبة بترددوا من يستخدموا المواصلات العامة فبالتالي إحنا يعني خلقنا هاي البيئة المناسبة والمريحة للمستخدمين أشكرك على هاي الملاحظات القيمة We shall go to Marrakesh Assuming that you are in Marrakesh Kantal. We don't know these days because we are online <laughs> yes, I am in Marrakesh, indeed. <laughs> Thank you for your Welcome. patience. 
<laughs> no problem, no problem. So I turn it over to you to introduce yourself and your uh, phenomenal project, which I, I got to see firsthand. I, uh, I wish the audience can experience it as well, and the lovely setting and, and, and weather of uh, Marrakesh and hospitality. So uh, all yours, Kanta. Thank you. Well, thank you for the occasion to participate online. Looking forward for uh, meeting you all in reality. You're most welcome here to visit our bicycle project here in Marrakesh. Um, I am originally from the Netherlands. And uh, five years ago, I decided to go to Morocco to start a bicycle project that would create on one hand job opportunities and education possibilities for youth and on the other side uh, making sure that there would be a good influence on public tra or transportation sustainable urban transportation environment and health um, and the beautiful thing uh, that the bicycle is a very simple object uh, has a very accessible um, character and we use that actually as our powerful vehicle to include a lot of youth in in our project um, so like I said it was five years ago that I came here um, we are now active in uh, three cities in Morocco so we're really also expanding the concept to different uh, cities and um, um, we have found a very good balance between making also the the, the project self-sustainable by creating business models around the bike and um, before corona that was mainly with ecotourism so we would train moroccan youth to become bicycle guides and um, bicycle mechanics and then they would be assuring a fantastic visit by bike around the city for tourists and for locals and um, our team had grown up to 30 young people here, um, which are all under 25. So it's a very, very young youth driven organization. And uh, I'm the oldest. <laughs> I'm 30. <laughs> Oh yeah, the, <laughs> but it's, uh, for, for, uh, for Moroccan standards, it's very exceptional that we are such a thriving young organization, which with very young people who take the responsibilities for, for all those projects. Then with Corona, we went into bicycle delivery. So much more focused on uh, making sure that goods were going from A to B. We're working with uh, Decathlon at the moment to deliver products that people buy on their platform. So in a way we could transform the bicycle tour guides to a new position as bicycle delivery um couriers and in that way we were able to also keep that whole, our whole team together and um yeah i think like in many many countries the bicycle doesn't really have a social status like we are under estimating what the bicycle can do um and what we are trying here is that we could change that identity and that image of the bike by making it much more attractive and to actually show that cycling is the first transformation of mobility after walking so it's, it's the very first start of getting more access to mobility but it also comes back at the end of the you know after motorcycle cars planes trains it comes back in high density urban mobility as a very efficient mean of transportation uh, in very wealthy and, and, and urban environments. So we try to use those two elements. We do bicycle projects to donate bicycles for kids to go to school. Recently, we donated 500 bikes in a rural area so that kids can go to school. But on the other hand, we're working very much on how could the bicycle function within the urban grid of Marrakesh and that we valorize that cycling is a choice and it's not um, because you do not have the money or the opportunity to get yourself another kind of vehicle so we try to play with those contrasts you know the, the poor and the very advanced way of using the bicycle as a solution for mobility and then and then specifically we have an approach also for having girls involved um because um it's not 
here in, in, in Morocco, people, girls also cycle, especially young girls, but it's not very much encouraged and and very soon they they kind of oh, very yeah there's plenty of them that do not cycle and there's plenty that will drop cycling once they are 10 or 14 years old they're not they're not continuing cycling anymore so for them we have we try in the organization already to have an equal amount of men women um, so in the technical team that's a little bit complicated but the girls they excel on project management organization and 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 uh, partnerships so i have very nice mix of uh, men and women in the team and then this well we have cycling classes for for women and and for girls so uh, in which we are talking about uh traffic rules and um, because plenty of of them are just also afraid of traffic how to participate in traffic so we're building on their confidence and making sure that they have better understanding of the traffic rules and the traffic safety uh, and how to anticipate in traffic because it's a super important I, I think it's the most important aspect of being part of the traffic is how you anticipate on your surroundings and uh, then we 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 guide them through a little bit of environment and empathy empowerment and even entrepreneurship so that you you know we're trying really to not only talk about the bike but really about moving yourself like you're being out there being part of public space being part of mobility so we're kind of using that bicycle as a very simple tool to talk about much more than only cycling and um that works off pretty well. And then after they have followed the courses, which is six, six sessions, we offer also um, tours and days that we just go out with a bunch of women to do a picnic, to visit a museum, to do uh, shopping, you know, we do just to make them more comfortable to keep that habit going because we want not only to do the cycling workshops and that they fall back in the same habit so we try to accompany that afterwards through through those activities and also offering bicycles that are accessible and, and pricing that would also encourage them and uh what i think that is a wonderful thing for women also with the bike is that it kind of gives you also an uh, i would say an ali ali alibi alibi like a reason to be in public space. Like once you're just walking or you have nothing, people, public space is not super uh, safe, not very uh, enhancing uh, in many places. So if a woman would be just around or walking, they, they feel a little bit more vulnerable. But the moment when you have your bike next to you, when you're holding even just your bike, suddenly there is a reason for you to be in public space and it is kind of more easy for them to be out and to be in public space it's like i we i could compare that a little bit within europe we would go out with the dog suddenly you have a reason to be out in public space and you have chats and there's but it's very normal that you're out there and your dog is your alibi to be out there and i see that the bicycle is a little bit an alibi to to be to participate and to be out for girls in a kind of a, uh, more, you know, it, it, it facilitates a little bit for them to be in public space and it gives them a reason and a destination in the end. When you have your bike, you're also gonna go somewhere most likely. So yeah, that's a little bit what I'm, what I'm doing here in Morocco. And um, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's a fantastic experience. We're trying really to mix the needs of the cultural social side with also the needs of the city. So we're also talking to um, local authorities, what we have to do about road safety and the infrastructure, um, which are very difficult topics. But um, with our simple bicycle, we try to you know, tackle different social uh, issues and, and it's, it goes well. And we, are, we have um, wonderful partners, wonderful results, and we're growing. So we are super happy also to find partners in other cities or in other countries that we could collaborate with to pilot different projects around cycling and how we get people moving around town or move forward in their lives. 
Thank you very much, Kantal. I and I'm very happy that uh, to hear that your project is still thriving even with COVID. And uh, what what strikes me is is uh, you you know aiming to to be sustainable in all aspects, sustainable financially by creating a business model that would allow you as well um, to 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 reach out to the community. So it's it's not all about profit and money, but with this, this engagement. And, and if we look at the strategic yeah. level, uh, being able to promote. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. And being able to promote uh, cycling uh, as, as a mode of transport. And I really, I mean, I, I would like to come back uh, after we give you a break uh, to this notion of taking space on, on, on in public space, you know, so, so when you are with a bike, because I think there's, when we talk about some of the psychology related to owning a car and not any car, a bigger car, you know, a sport utility vehicle, the bigger, the better, because then you feel, you know, you are more powerful on the road, you're taking up more space and you feel more protected, I guess. And, and we can accomplish that with the bike as well. That, uh, and what needs to be done, um, you know, on the infrastructure side, on the, on the regulation side to, to respect the rules of the road so that, you know, people are more sensitive to other users. So thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Uh, perhaps we go back to Sahar uh, and pick up on, on our discussion. Um, you know, uh, engineer Wissam spoke about the plans and, the, and you know, the, there's always the financial constraint. And, but what you drew was, a, uh, actually, I'll switch to Arabic. Seat in the Arabic. مع أهميتها أكثر من إنه فقط مراعاة حقوق مستخدمين وإنه نتأكد إنه إنه ما تركنا حدا اللي أعطيناهم فرصة التنقل مشان يوصلوا للفرص التعليمية والاقتصادية والاجتماعية والصحية وما إلى ذلك هل هل باعتقاد يعني شو بنقدر كيف نقدر نفصل موضوع عدم توفر الخدمات عدم توفر البنية التحتية الكافية عن موضوع إنه لما يصير عنا خدمات أو لما يكون عنا خدمات إن هاي الخدمات تأخذ بعين الاعتبار كافة المستخدمين بحيث إنها على الأقل تعطي مثال إيجابي اللي يشجع استخدام أكثر يعني أنا إذا إذا بتسمحي لي أستخدم دبي مثلا كمثال إنه في ال ال يعني ربما مش كامل نظام النقل العام والتنقل بدبي في مناطق كثير مثلا أنا بقدرش أوصلها كمستخدم للنقل العام ولكن الخدمات المتوفرة بتراعي المعايير الضرورية إلي كمستخدم للنقل العام بكافة يعني الطبقات بكافة الشرائح فشو برأيك يعني نرجع للأردن واللي بنطبق على كثير من دول المنطقة اللي اللي ما قطعت شوط ب بموضوع المواصلات العامة إذا بتسمح طبعا شكرا السؤال يعني في صلب الموضوع صراحة يعني على موضوع التخطيط نقل العام وأخذ منظور النوع الاجتماعي أو إذا بدي أعرفه أنا من منظور العدالة الاجتماعية إذا اليوم عملنا نحكي على المدن المستدامة والمدن المستدامة يجب أن تكون مدن عادلة يعني هيك نفهمها عادلة سواء لمين عادلة لسكانها يعني المدينة يجب أن تكون عادلة لكافة سكانها وإذا بدنا نقيم المدينة من أو عدالة مدى عدالة المدينة نتطلع أولا بداية على التخطيط في مرحلة التخطيط فعن لا يجب أن يكون هذه المرحلة تخطط لأضعف السكان أضعف ساكن وساكنة في هذه المدينة إذا كانت الخطط المتعلقة بالنقل العام خلينا نحكي تغطي احتياجاتهم وتأخذ احتياجاتهم بين الاعتبار رح أعرف أنه هذا التخطيط لهاي المدينة هو تخطيط شامل وعنده منظور يراعي الاحتياجات كافة لأنه إذا تحسنت الخدمات أو الوصول للخدمات الوصول للفرص التعليمية الوصول للخدمات الصحية الوصول للحضانات لأكثر 
فئة هشة فأنا عارف بعرف أنها تتحسن بعشرات الدرجات للفئات الأكثر تمكنا فيها وبالتالي وهون بيجي موضوع استدامة المدن من منظور النوع الاجتماعي وأهمية وجود إطار اجتماعي للعدالة البيئية خلينا نحكي منظور اجتماعي ليس فقط مبني على مثلا العدالة بين الجنسين لكن أنا بحكي على الجميع ولما بحكي جنسين أنا كمان بطلع على النساء ما بحطهم كوحدة متجانسة واحدة النساء تختلف في احتياجاتها باختلاف وضع الاقتصادي والاجتماعي والمكاني في هذه المدينة فهناك المرأة العاملة هنا أو الموظفة هناك المرأة العاملة بعمل رعائي غير مدفوع الأجر هناك المرأة من كبار السن المعيلة للأسرة أيضا وكل واحدة من هدول لها احتياجات ربما تتقاطع ولكنها تختلف وبحاجة أن تؤخذ بعين الاعتبار عند التخطيط لعملية النقل العام وأنا بحكي على النقل العام لأنه هو بالنسبة لنا معيق أساسي للنساء والرجال أيضا لدخول سوق العمل ف... لكن الطريقة التي تؤثر فيها ضعف المنظومة على النساء مثلا تختلف بسبب اختلاف الأدوار الاجتماعية بسبب العبء الرعائي اللي المنوط بالنساء يعني المرأة اختلاف طبيعة رحلتها وأعتقد السامعين هون قد عندهم فكرة عن الموضوع رحلة المرأة تختلف بشكل جذري عن رحلة الرجل باختلاف احتياجاتها فهي رحلات قصيرة قريبة من بعضها متكررة ربما تستحب طفلها للحضانة طفل آخر للمدرسة إذا كانت امرأة عاملة تذهب إلى العمل ثم تذهب إلى التسوق بعد انتهاء العمل ثم تستحب الأطفال إذا كانت لديها أعباء رعائية معانية بعناية بشخص كبير السن في أسرتها ربما تستحبه للطبيب وهكذا ورحلة الرجل يعني بالمنظور التقليدي جدا فهي من البيت إلى العمل وبالعكس وبالتالي كلما كانت هناك صعوبة في المنظومة كلما قلت فرص خروج النساء للحيز العام وعشان هيك لما نشوف الرقم 47% في الأردن من النساء يعزفنا عن دخول سوق العمل إحنا عم تحكي على 47% قلت قل خروجهم للفضاء العام وبالتالي قلت فرص إنهم يأخذوا وظائف قلت فرص إنهم يكونوا اجتماعيا موجودات على الساحة سياسيا مشاركات وأيضا في مراكز صنع القرار أو في التخطيط لهذه العملية ذكرت قبل شوي المهندسة وسام أهمية أن وجود النساء في أماكن صنع القرار وهذا أساسي في عملية النقل لأنه هناك منظور تأتي به المرأة في هذا المكان ليأخذ بعين الاعتبار النساء المستخدمات ووضع وإعلاء صوتهم خلينا نحكي عند عملية التخطيط هذا جانب الجانب الآخر لأنه هاي المنظومة ضعيفة وغير فاعلة تتقاطع احتياجات النساء والرجال أنا عم بحكي على الأردن في كثير من الأحيان وتتقاطع خلينا نقول صعوبات استخدامها سواء كانت بعدم النظافة ربما سواء بقلة الترددات سواء كانت بموضوع الأمن والأمان طبعا يؤثر على النساء بشكل أوسع فأتى يعني أتت أهمية أن نخطط للنقل العام من منظور النوع الاجتماعي لتحقيق الاستدامة في مدينة مثل عمان وهذا منظور جديد يعني أنا بحكي مش بس عليه علينا إحنا يعني في العالم أخذ سياسات النوع الاجتماعي وتضمينها في سياسات النقل مش مش قديم فإحنا يعني الصراحة أخذنا خطوة مهمة في تطوير الإطار الوطني للنقل العام من منظور النوع الاجتماعي اللي طورناه بالتعاون مع وزارة النقل وأيضا بدعم من يو ان ومن وأطلقنا السنة الماضية أعتقد وعنده بنود مختلفة خمس ست بنود أساسها الإطار التشريعي فيجب أن ننظر إلى القوانين والسياسات التي تحكم عملية التنقل وإدخال نظرة تراعي النوع الاجتماعي فيها الجانب الآخر 
حكينا عنه اللي هو التخطيط خلال للبنية التحتية من منظور يراعي أيضا العدالة الاجتماعية والنوع الاجتماعي واحتياجات كافة المستخدمين والمستخدمات ذكرت المهندسة وسام مثلا أهمية أنه يكون هناك دعم سبسيديز للتذاكر أو للنساء المستخدمات اللي بتستخدم المنظومة بشكل أكثر من الرجل مثلا ولكن يجب أن يراعى تراعى احتياجاتها يراعى فكرة أنها هي قد تكون تصطحب طفل فربما أيضا دعم هذه التذكرة أو إعفاءه منها ذكرنا أيضا موضوع الأمن والأمان وهو شيء أساسي يعني 62% من النساء في الأردن المستخدمات للمنظومة أو لمنظومة النقل العام يتعرضنا لنوع من أنواع التحرش وهي بالدراسة اللي ذكرتها قبل قليل كانت نتيجة يجب أن تأخذ بعين الاعتبار زيادة عدد النساء العاملات في الشرطة أو حتى تخصيص ربما مثال مثل دبي شرطة للنقل على أساس موضوع التبليغ ومتابعة الشكاوى وما إلى ذلك الإطار الوطني للنقل العام أيضا يأخذ بعين الاعتبار إعلاء صوت النساء سواء في صنع القرار تمام أو إعلاء صوت النساء المستخدمات للمنظومة أخذ احتياجاتهم في عين الاعتبار ووضع وإيجاد مكان لهم على الطاولة في ربما العملية التشريعية وأيضا في العملية عملية التخطيط وزيادة عددهم في كعاملات في هذا القطاع هلا أنا بدي أحكي على نقطة نعم نتفق على أنه أهمية وجود النساء في كافة الساحات وتحديدا في قطاع النقل العام اللي هو ذكوري بشكل كبير يعني 99% إذا بدنا نحكي خصوصا في ما يتعلق بالسائقين حاليا أو حتى المشغلين ولكن هناك نقطة أساسية يجب أن نراعيها قبل أن نفتح باب التوظيف أو حتى لو فتحنا إحنا هل سنحافظ على النساء العاملات في هذا القطاع يعني هل إذا بكرة فتحنا 200 وظيفة لسائقات حافلات أو كوسترز أو بساط مدرسة هل ستبقى النساء في هذه الوظائف هل البيئة الموجودة للعمل بيئة حقوقية أو داعمة لوجودها هل هناك مرافق صحية مثلا هل هناك أسلوب لحماية هذه النساء السائقات هل هناك هل تؤخذ احتياجاتهم أو أعمالهم الرعائية أيضا في هذا الاعتبار هل هناك حضانات لهم مثلا فالبيئة يجب أن تكون داعمة ومهيئة لاستقبال النساء العاملات في قطاع النقل العام وتحديدا في الوظائف التي ذكرتها قبل قليل قبل ان نقول انه اهلا وسهلا لانه ما بدنا اياهم يدخلوا ويفشلوا ونقول جربنا وما حدا قدم او جربنا وتركوا وهذا الشيء طبعا يكون يعني فيها ظلم كبير لهم يعني ايضا موضوع الكود اوف كوندكت او التي ذكرته المهندسه وسام هذا شيء مهم جدا ويجب ان يعني الاهم من ذلك هو تطبيقه وأعلم أن هناك تطبيق حاليا يقوم بتنفيذه أو بدعم من البنك الدولي للتبليغ عن الخروقات على هذه المدونة وسيكون متاح لكافة المستخدمين والمستخدمات ويعني نقطة أخيرة بالنسبة لعملية التخطيط والاستدامة الموضوع يتعلق بأكثر من جانب الجانب التخطيط وجانب التطبيق وإحنا عندنا التطبيق هو التحدي الأكبر ويمكن دكتور أيمن ممكن عندك تجربة مباشرة يعني أنت اشتغلت في الأردن في هذا القطاع بشكل كبير التطبيق والمراقبة والمتابعة عليه يعني وإدخال KPIs معينة تتعلق بالنوع الاجتماعي متطلبات معينة لكل مشروع أو مشاريع البنية التحتية الكبرى يجب أن يكون هناك منظور يأخذ بعين الاعتبار احتياجات كافة المستخدمين والمستخدمات ومنظور اجتماعي يراعي هذا التمايز ويعني لا يجوز اليوم يعني أنه يكون في هناك مشروع أو مشروع كبير للنقل العام بدون أن يأخذ هناك دراسة متعلقة بمنظور النوع الاجتماعي لأنه مرشح جدا أنه ما ينجحش إذا لم يكن يفتح المجال لاستخدام 
كافة المستخدمين والمستخدمات ولو أنه حتى من منظور اقتصادي يعني إذا نظرنا فعملية التخطيط يجب أن تضع الإنسان في قلب قلب العملية وليس فقط يعني من من منظور واحد متفرد حاليا وشكرا لك شكرا سهر اي ثينك يعني في واحده من من الافكار اللي يعني تفضلت في جواهر يعني مبني على معلومات صحيحه وربما كان في عندي شوي تفاؤل زايد اني بقول انه هل هل في شيء يمنع انه يكون في عندنا سائقات للحافلات للتكاسي بجوز النقطه اللي بحاول اصل الها انه مش عارف بالعربي شو هي الكريتيكال ماس يعني خلق كثافه معينه بحيث انه اذا حدا ما عنده الوعي الكافي لا لا بدنا ناخذ المتطلبات المختلفه لفئات المجتمع واذا بنحكي على موضوع الجندر الرجل والمراه انه بوجود عدد اكبر ب كعاملين وكصانعي قرار وكمستخدمين احنا بنغير الثقافه لانه انا باعتقادي ربما يعني احد الاسئله اللي احنا دائما بتشابهنا اللي هي موضوع النقل العام فعليا بغير ثقافه وليس فقط موضوع تنقل ووصول لفرص يعني احنا في كثير بديش احكي عنها شعارات ولكن هي مثبته انه وجود نظام مواصلات عامه بشجع على الديمقراطيه بشجع على التواصل الاجتماعي بشجع على احترام الاخر بدنا نوقف بالدور بدنا نعطي اولويه للناس بتشوفي هذا يعني التعامل الطيب لما يكون حدا بالمترو بشوفه حدا كبير حتى انا للاسف هلا قاعدين بعرضوا علي مقعد وهذا بزعجني كثير ودائما برفض حتى لو بدي اوقف نص ساعه بالمترو لانه يعني انه استك ام نوت ذات اولد يعني شكرا بس انه الفكره هذا التعامل نتج عن 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 هاي المنظومه فبالتالي يعني احنا نسعى وجوز ربما راح يكون في شويه تضحيه اكيد من من الرواد او الرائدات اللي اللي راح يشقوا هذا الطريق وانا صحيح يا ريت لو كانت معنا المهندسه وسام انه هل جابهت صعوبات بدورها في منصب قيادي لما تحكي عن حقوق المراه باجتماعات وزراء مثلا او مجالس اداره وما الى ذلك فانا بتاكد انه في نوع من التحدي آه بس هي هي قديش في عنا آه صوت وقنوات للتعبير عن 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 هاي الاراء المختلفه بحيث انه نخلق طاقه ايجابيه انها تقدر تقدر تغير آه بدي على على هذه البيئه آه اذا كان تال بتسمح لي نرجع للملازم خديجه بس شوي اني اتبع على موضوع بيئه العمل آه لانه هذا هذا موضوع مهم انه اذا بدنا نشجع اكثر نساء يكون في قطاع النقل اللي هو ذكوري بشكل كبير خاصه في منطقتنا ملازم خديجه بالنسبه شو كيف ظروف العمل يعني انت ك كامراه وما بعرف اذا اذا عندك اطفال او شو 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 بيئه العمل اللي بتشجعك انك انت تكوني في هذا الموقع انه ما تترددي آه، انت وزميلاتك بحيث انك انت بتصيري يعني آه، قدوه اتس يور رو موديل يعني احنا مرات كثير بنقول ضروري نشجع وخاصه الصغار بالسن آه، انه هي في قصص نجاح وما فيش شيء يعني محدد آه، لا فيميل او ميل فاذا اذا بعد اذنك تشاركينا رايك بهذا الموضوع تمام ان شاء الله اجابة على سؤالك نعم انا ام لخمسه ابناء وفخوره اني اكون في السلك الامني العسكري لله الحمد يمكن سياسه الدوله ورؤيه الحكومه في المساواه ما بين الجنسين تعديناها حتى هي مرحله المساواه ما بين الجنسين حتى في تمكين المراه في كل الوظائف نحن ماذا نملك في امن المواصلات لنجعل عمل المرأة سواء الميداني أو الإداري بيئة مثالية للعمل أنا شخصيا كعضوة موجودة في اللجنة النسائية لجنة تم تأسيسها لمتابعة شؤون العاملات الموظفات الكوادر الأمنية الميدانية والإدارية نسمعهم ناخذ بيدهم دائما أنا أكرر عليهم كل ما أقولهم كلنا نملك صوت لكن لابد أن نستخدمه 
انت تملكين صوت وانا املك صوت وكنا لابد ان نستخدمه. نحن من خلال هذه اللجنه، نحن مش لجنه وصايه عليهم، لجنه نقرب الاصوات، نسمع مشاكلهم، في كوادر امنيه رجال مسؤولين اشرافيين مباشرين عليهم، لكن ربما المراه في لها ظروفها، لها اشياء ما تقدر تشارك فيها كرجل، نحن نكون قناه تواصل ما بين المراه وشو تحتاجها في ظروف عملها ولنوصل لاصحاب القرار. ايضا نقول في امن المواصلات نحن محظوظين جدا بدعم قوي من الاداره العليا عندنا المتمثله بالعميد عبيد الحسبور للمراه موجوده في كافه اللجان، موجوده في كافه المجالس المراه، موجوده في المناصب الاشرافيه، في التخطيط الاستراتيجي، في كل مكان موجوده المراه لله الحمد، مثل ما قلت لك يمكن اللجنه النسائيه الموجوده عندنا اللي تدعم المراه الى جانب اذكر اني انا نزلت ميدان كنا ننزل ميدان نسمع البنات ناخذ ملاحظاتهم لان العمل الميداني يختلف يعني تحدياته يختلف عن العمل الاداري اللي انا ياسه في الاداره. فيمكن ننزل نسمع الميدان احيد شفت امرأة يعني ما شاء الله عليها الكل يشار إليها بالبنان الرجال يشارون عليها أنها دائماً واقفة في ساحة المحطة دائماً موجودة أنها تجيب على استفسار الجمهور هي روحة بادر أنها تروح للجمهور تسألهم قدرت تبني علاقة حلوة في محيط المحطة اللي هي موجودة فيها سألتها متحابة تينا الإدارة أن ننقلها يعني تأتينا الإدارة عنا إذا عندك شيء كان عندها شغف كبير أنها تقوم بورش تثقيفية للطلاب المدارس قلت لها حابة تأتيني الإدارة قالت لي أبدا أنا حابة عملي حابة أني أكون موجودة في الميدان فأنا غرت أمانة يعني غرت قلت واو يعني أنا أراها العمل الميداني تحدي لكن بس ما شاء الله عليها يعني مثلها الكثيرات موجودات في المحطات موجودات حابين عملهم حابين حركة النشاط اللي موجودة في المحطات أيضا الجانب ثاني أحب أركز فيه أيضا غير نحن تأهيلهم الأمني للكوادر النسائية في عنا اهتمام كبير أيضا في الجانب الرياضي والجانب المعرفي عنا فرق نسائية رياضية يدخلون كافة البطولات المحلية الموجودة عندنا مع فرق شرط شرطية ثانية والأبنية ثانية فالاهتمام بكافة حتى وجودي أنا اليوم معاكم دكتور أيمن هذا داعم أيضا للمرأة أنا أنا أطلع وأتكلم في هذا المجال يعني فلله الحمد ما نواجه هذه التحديات موجودات نحن في أنظمة في سياسات موجودة عندنا لتمكين المرأة أكيد أنا ما راح أقول إن العمل الميداني ما يخلو من التحديات أكيد في تحديات لكن اللي أنا شفته على أرض الواقع مع بناتنا في فخر أنهم موجودات هناك على أرض الميدان وإحنا وإحنا فخورين إنك معانا ومنقدر كلكم إنكم معانا اليوم بهاي يعني المساهمات سؤال بجوز تفصيلي مثلا لما تعملوا شفتات خاصة للميدان يعني وحدة عندها مثلا اطفال يعني انت هون تكيف تكيفت المؤسسه او او دائره امن المواصل اداره امن المواصلات بحيث انه هذا صار شيء طبيعي يعني لانه في نظره بتعرفي بمجتمعنا مرات كثير المقاومه عنصر النسائي هذا آه بدها تروع على اولادها هذا آه بتقدرش تتاخر ما فيش مواصلات ما فيش كذا هذه كل هالامور فيا ريت انك يعني كيف عالجتوها هاي التفاصيل؟ هل في مثلا حضانه خاصه للعاملات بامن المواصلات؟ شو شو الترتيبات اللي 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 الخاصه بالكادر النسائي اذا اذا في ترتيبات خاصه؟ نعم مثل ما ذكرتك نحن اللجنه النسائيه عندنا تعنى بكافه شؤون المراه في امن المواصلات تهتم بكافه الامور اللي يواجهونها الحاضنات اكون وياك صريحه خاصه في امن المواصلات ما نملكها لكن في رؤيه مستقبلا ان شاء الله باذن الله تكون لنا حضانه، عندنا حضانه لشرطه دبي لاطفال شرطه دبي لكن خاص كادارتنا ما عندنا، لكن في هناك مرونه كبيره في سياسات العمل بالنسبه للعاملات من الامهات نسبه كبيره من العاملات الموجودات عندنا امهات من الكوادر النسائيه يعني ف في دعم من هذه في مرونه في السياسه حتى من الاشرافيين الرجال عليهم في عمل الشفتات 
احب اذكر بعد ايضا احنا راس السنه عندنا الشغل يكون اوفرلود يعني هنا المراه تكون متحمسه صراحه اكثر يعني انا عن نفسي انه يس خلاص خلينا ننزل الميدان يعني الحماس يكون اكبر على الرغم ان احنا اشتغل يعني يمكن لساعات متاخره يمكن ما وفيت الاجابه على سؤالك دكتور ايمن لكن عندنا مرونه في السياسه عندنا مرونه ايضا في المراه سواء كانت ام او غير ام شكرك لا يعني جاوبتي شكرا شكرا can tell are you with us or are you hiding so so that i decide where i go to amman or marrakesh and to my uh, to my bosses uh, sara and dina but we still have half hour, half hour correct correct me if i'm wrong you have all the time in the world <laughs> thank you thank you very much so um going back to uh to kental to speak uh, about a couple of things that uh, i'm curious about and one i actually it came as a question um so uh, you mentioned um, you know the, the the social view if you will about women especially using bikes and how girls they use bikes and then up to a certain age they ditch them and then uh, they don't ride anymore and i saw firsthand if i remember correctly you had a little park next to your shop and this is where you do your riding lessons and i saw some women in traditional clothes uh that we're attempting to to ride the bike so if you can speak about this you know how you penetrated this taboo if you will social taboo uh by by you know encouraging women uh you know to to use the bike to to learn how to use the bike um and and then i will follow up with another question about safety and the and the road space if you don't yeah. mind yeah. well um we have have different ways to reach out to women of the community and to kind of um, encourage them to join. But as it is a very social activity, like uh, you're very much in touch with each other and you're, you can communicate while exercising or while trying. And I think also the great thing is that, especially with a little bit older women that do not have a lot of experience with cycling, for them it's wonderful to see that there's very quick progress in that exercise so at first it seems for them impossible and way too dangerous to to cycle but actually in one two three classes they can really see that there's progress happening and it's kind of magical uh, so i think that the activity itself is already great fun for them to join to talk there's plenty of space and and you go so slow that you can constantly talk so they're constantly making jokes and 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 having fun and and they're supportive to each other to encourage you know to 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 find that balance on those two wheels and um i think uh, we we we're not pushing we're just putting the positive uh, energy on that cycling moves you and that you can learn things and that you can meet people and like i said we talk a little bit about empowerment and being part of public space but in a very you know in indirect way but we it is a kind of empowering uh, workshop in, in in itself so yeah i think this is this we we break a bit the taboo because it's such a show, social activity and it has a, a physical exercise in it so people are also more and more aware of their health so we also try to use that as an as a, as a push to encourage them to do this and then just the fun of it and uh, that you can see that there's results coming off of uh, in just a few classes so that that all works and if you facilitate it well and if you have nice and funny and young instructors doing that then then uh, yeah then it's just great fun for women to join thank you it's, it's really cool i mean I, I i love the concept and and uh, you know seeing i mean trying to imagine how you know women are riding bike and they're talking and they're you know absorbing the city i mean this is why we we love bikes so much uh, uh, if you actually want to see some uh, city, you know, either walk or or, or bike, uh, that's the best way. Now, for for sharing the road and and maybe if 
was there anything negative in, in a couple of aspects? One aspect is that what was the reaction of the community, of especially the male uh, community, as they see women riding bike in traditional neighborhoods, uh, crowded neighborhoods, and sometimes I, I, if I venture uh, out to say dangerous, uh, you know, in terms of traffic, uh, so which raises the safety issue as well. Um, you know, have you had issues with safety how do we how do you promote it? i'm not even sure that there's like people wear protective gear um how, how do you deal with that with that aspect if you don't mind yeah well it's a, it's a good question and the road safety is a real issue and a real threat to our activities and and it does have an effect on the continuation of women cycling so we have situations where their partner tells them it's not a very good idea to go into traffic it's way too dangerous and i would rather have you in a car safe and secure going from a to b and um, uh, nevertheless for short distances the bicycle can still be uh, um, an option for them so you know for for very short distances the bicycle is used and um yeah, we try to, with the cycling classes, they wear protective gear. We also encourage everyone to, to wear helmets and to uh, take precaution. Um, and um, we have a city center with, where it's where it's a very high density of traffic, but it also means that the, the speed of the traffic is very low. So in a way that is a little bit in advance, like that, enormous chaos is also a little bit an advantage in a way that if something would happen it would be at a speed of 20 or 30 kilometers an hour so which reduces a little bit the risks for cycling mm -hmm. and and people here are constantly you have everyone is at, at anticipating on each other here in the traffic because there's a car coming by but at the same road is the donkey and uh, a few chicken <laughs> or cats or um, so there is all these different speeds and and units big small fast that are using the same uh, infrastructure so people are super attentive to that speed difference and that possibility that people are not staying in a straight line so that um i do i do think that they're in the, in that chaos is a kind of safety because people are so aware of those different traffic participants and that the speed is low because you cannot go faster in that high density traffic environment but we're really trying now with the uh, centre d'investissement here in marrakesh to look into ways that we can improve sustainable uh, and active mobility in marrakesh and how especially safety is there a major issue to, to be improved if you want more people to participate. Meaning creating some bike, bicycle lanes. Yeah, bicycle lanes. Yeah, and also safe um, trottoir passage for- For, for sections, sure. Yeah. For, sure. yeah, also for pedestrians, yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Mm. Um, Sahar can't be hiding. <laughs> So I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, we have some questions uh, because I want to be fair, not the only one throwing out uh, in the questions. Um, so um, the question is, I think it's from Dina or Sarah, I'm not sure, it says regional climate. Uh, so, uh, but, but anyway. The, the question is related to mobilizing the private sector and, and, and creating a voice. And I guess, you know, Sadaqa is a voice uh, in, a, in a way. And, and I know Ma'an Nasl and, you know, different groups, but again, creating this critical mass. Um, I mean, how do you see that happen? In fact, I know for a fact that you were meeting, I saw the news several times over the last two years, meeting with parliaments and um, you know, as they were drafting different laws or you were trying at least, you know, to get them to think about these requirements. So how, how does that go? I mean, how much more 
can you do to, to get things actually changed on the ground and to mobilize? والله شكرا على هذا السؤال وشكرا على متابعة أخبارنا يعني هي موضوع الأدفوكسي اللي بنشتغله إحنا كمؤسسة مجتمع مدني وكناشطات في هذا في هذا المجال هو جزء يعني من حياتنا اليومية نعم تعاون أو بشكل مباشر بيكون مع الغرف التشريعية مع البرلمان ومع اللجان المختلفة سواء كان لجان العمل إذا كان لقانون العمل أو لجنة النقل والخدمات ولكن الـ الـ يعني في أمور بتاخذ مداح مع الأسف يعني أعطيك على سبيل المثال موضوع تغيير قانون العمل أو تعديله أخذنا عشر سنوات عشر سنوات لتعديل مادة واحدة وصارت الفرصة عدلنا شيء خمسة وراها اللي هي متعلقة برفع المشاركة الاقتصادية للنساء في سوق العمل أو إيش النفس طويل يجب أن يكون ولكن أيضا هناك يعني نقدرش نقول إنه ما إنه الوقت لا يخدمنا بعض الأحيان بيكون في تعلم على الطريق والشخص أو أو الجهة اللي معنية برفع أصوات سواء النساء العاملات خلينا نحكي إذا بنحكي أو الموظفات اللي بنحكي باسمهم وأولئك الباحثات عن عمل أيضا المتعطلات اللي بنحكي باسمهم في أروقة مجلس النواب على قانون العمل بيصير في تعلم على الطريق ومثلا على موضوع الحضانات بحكي مع الملازم خديجة لما بلشنا كان القانون فقط معني بإنشاء حضانة في نفس مكان العمل أخذ عشر سنوات أي نعم لتعديله لكن ضمننا الآن أصبح للأسر للأمهات والأباء وأصبح هناك نماذج مختلفة يعني ربما إذا بحب نحكي معكم أيضا على التجربة بتاعتنا اللي ما لنا بنخوضها الآن مع الشرطة أو كلية الشرطة في في الأردن في هذا في هذا الإطار وفي استهداف حضانات هناك ودعمها هذا جانب ولكن أيضا في جانب ثاني اللي هو إحنا يعني منحاول قد ما بنقدر ك... وهذا وظيفتنا كمجتمع مدني لكن هناك شيء احنا ما بنقدر عليه لم... اللي هو تفعيل الإرادة السياسية نعم نطالب ونضع مطالبنا ونخوض ونضع الدراسات ومنحط ال... ال- compelling argument مثل ما بيقولوا بيقولوا ولكن بالنهاية يجب أن تكون هناك إرادة سياسية تتعلق بإدماج مثلا سياسات النوع الاجتماعي في سياسات النقل وهذا ما لمسنا مثلا يعني بال 2016 او 2014 لما بلشنا الشغل على قانون النقل العام اذا بتذكر دكتور ايمن حكينا على موضوع واحنا كنا ك... احنا كناشطات من صداقه كنا جزء من حمله وطنيه اسمها مع النصل للمطالبه بنقل عام امن ل... واعلاء اصوات المستخدمين والمستخدمات وهون شكلنا مجموعه ترفع اصوات المستخدمين والمستخدمات وحضرنا كنا لأول مرة في التاريخ نمثل مصلحة المستخدمين والمستخدمات دائما بيقعد على الطاولة أصحاب العمل مثلا أو المشغلين ربما السائقين ومجموعاتهم ونقاباتهم ولكن إحنا ما كان إلنا صوت فهذا جانب نعم العمل من خلال هذه المجموعات وبعرف إذا حازم المهندس حازم زريقات معنا اليوم بقدر أو يمكن حكى في جلسات سابقة عن عن هذه التجربة هذا جانب أهمية إذا بدي أحكي أيضا على دخول النساء لهذا المجال ف... والمطالبة ببيئة عمل داعمة لهم إذا كان هناك مجموعة والكريتيكال ماس صارت أو صار في تداخلات يجب أن يكون ممثلين ممثلات والتمثيل كما نعرفه هو عبر النقابات العمالية النقابات أو المجموعات التي تمثل مصالح العاملين والعاملات ب... يعني هذا بالإطار الكلاسيكي وينطبق على... على النقل أيضا أم... هناك تجربة أيضا لا بأس بها اللي هي موضوع إشراك سكان المدينة مثلا بأخذ قرارات معينة تتعلق بحياتهم في هذه المدينة أظن قبل فترة كان في واللي بيألف الحياة في عمان فصوت المدينة أيضا مرتبط بصوت عربات أو بيكابات شاحنات توزيع الغاز اللي بتشغل موسيقى معينة وأعتقد أمانة عمان خاضت تجربة استفتاء على شو نوع الموسيقى اللي بتحبوا تستخدموها يعني هذا نوع من إشراك السكان أو السكان المدينة في صنع القرار ويجب أن يكون ذلك أيضا على النقل يعني فلذلك هناك حاجة 
أخذ هذه الأصوات ربما عن طريق التطبيق وحدثت قبل قليل عن تطبيق مدونة السلوك أو تنفيذ مدونة السلوك ربما يكون عبر هذه هذا التطبيق ربما هناك أخذ لا ما رأيكم بهذه الخدمة أو حتى لو كان في هناك اعتراض أو تبليغ فيجب أن يكون هناك آلية للمتابعة على هذه التبليغات وتصب في مكان ما عند وضع السياسات المتعلقة ب الخدمة المقدمة على هذا الخط مثلا أو أو حتى بشكل أكبر يراعي الاحتياجات أو يعالج الخلل فهون تجميع الصوت ويأتي ولكن نعم نعرف أنه إحنا ربما بنكون في بوز المدفع زي ما بيقولوا ولكن هذا واجبنا كمجتمع مدني فاعل أنه لا لا, لا نيأس نعم يأخذ وقت وربما في هناك ملفات راح نعيش ونطلع من سوق العمل ونطلع من إطار النشاط على ذلك ولم تحل ولكن دائما يعني شو بيقولوا حياة الشعوب لا تقاس فينا هون اللي احنا قاعدين احنا بنكون جزء من عملية تطورها ونسعى لتغيير تشريعاتها التي تشرع مش لإلي وإلكم إذا تشرع لخمسين وستين سنة لقدام فيجب أن نراعي أن تكون هذه التشريعات تأخذ بعين الاعتبار النظرات المستقبلية شكرا سهر يعني برجع كمان حتى بالنسبة لموضوع الصوت وخلق هاي الإرادة السياسية ربما يعني واحدة من العوائق وبحب أسمع رأيك إنه صوت المستخدم النقل العام أو اللي بنادي لأنظمة النقل العام بيكون كتير واطي يعني يعني ما بينسمع بنفس الطريقة زي صوت الناس اللي بيستخدموا المركبات الخاصة يعني أنا أذكر حتى بتجربتي لما اشتغلت بأمانة عمان إنه يعني كان في كتير كل يوم تسمع الإذاعات لما كنت أنزل على الشغل الصبح كلها إذاعات في قضايا لمواطنين على هذا الباص متأخر عن هذا الخط أو أنه محمل عدد ركاب زائد أو أنه الشوفير السائق بيصير بسرعة مرتفعة جدا تدخين على الحق يونيمت يعني المشاكل التقليدية اللي بنسمع عنها آه وكل الحق يحكي عن هذا لكن لما نحاول نعمل إشي بتحسي أنه اه بس هذا يعني شو بدنا نعمل؟ بدنا نغير الباصات، بدنا نغير السائقين، بدنا نغير البنيه التحتيه، ما بنقدرش نعمل. نرجع لهذا الموضوع انه وين نبدا؟ بينما مثلا لما يصير شكوى على اشاره ضوئيه ولا هذا على طول نحكي مع مركز التحكم انه هذا توقيت الاشاره شو عملتوا؟ فضحتونا، هذا توقيت الاشاره الضوئيه بتغير فورا خاصه اذا كان حدا مسؤول. فبالتالي انا يعني هذا برضه بعد اللي هو انت تفضلتي فيه حتى ببدايه حديثك يعني هو رفع منظومه النقل العام انها تكون يعني جزء من انه العداله الاجتماعيه والنوع الاجتماعي وكل هاي المفاهيم انه انه يكون في مساواه بالتعامل بحيث انه هاي القضايا تاخذ الحيز الاهميه المناسب لها ما بعرف اذا بتوافقي مع هذا يعني طرح بوافقك 100% على موضوع اختلاف وقوة الصوت. وهذا يعني كمان دليل على انه منظومة النقل العام في الأردن وربما في مناطق شبيهة في في بلدان المنطقة العربية حولنا دليل كبير على انعدام العدالة الاجتماعية، يعني لما أنا صوتي لأني عندي قدرة اقتصادية معينة أشتري سيارة مثلا فصوتي سيكون أعلى بكثير من مستخدم النقل العام أو مستخدمة النقل العام اللي لما بنسألهم ليش بتستخدموا الموضوع لك لا يوجد لدي حل آخر النساء في في الدراسة التي قمنا بها 46% قالوا أنا ما بستخدم النقل العام لأنه حالتي المادية أنا ما عنديش خيار آخر فأصبحت المنظومة هي فقط لمن لا يستطيع أن يمتلك سيارة أو ما عنده القدرة المادية وبالتالي مع ضعف القدرة المادية يضعف الصوت مع الأسف الشديد يعني نحن نعيش في مجتمعات رأسمالية يعني النظام السائد هو النظام الرأسمالي لأن مؤسف هذا الشيء أو حتى تقل في العدالة الاجتماعية فهون في دورين في دور من أعلى اللي هو الإرادة السياسية بتوفير منصات تتيح للجميع وضع صوتهم أو إعلاء صوتهم بغض النظر عن 
هويتهم الطبقية أو ظروفهم الاقتصادية أو الاجتماعية ووضعهم الجغرافي في هذا المكان يجب أن يكون هناك دور لصناع القرار بإتاحة المجال في كل تشريع في كل مكان فيه قرارات تؤخذ لأخذ صوت الناس وهون العملية الديمقراطية التي حكيت عنها كل ما يعني العدالة الاجتماعية ترفع من ديمقراطية النقل العام أيضا مؤشر على الديمقراطية وسماع القرار وسماع الصوت لصنع القرار بشكل جماعي وأيضا هناك دور من أسفل المنظومة من من السكان من المستخدمين من من الناس العايشين في هذا هذه الرقعة الجغرافية لهم أيضا يتجمعوا يلاقوا أماكن لرفع صوتهم إذا في مظلومية معينة نظموا أنفسهم بشكل ربما عن طريق نقابة إذا كانت شكاوي عمالية أو عن طريق مجموعات حملات فيسبوك جروب أي شيء صحيح والتكنولوجيا تتيح لنا منصات التواصل الاجتماعي أصبحت أداة لإعلاء الصوت يعني فبالتالي هون هدول الدورين يعني بيكون في دور ضاغط ولكن ايضا هلا يعني ما بقدرش احكي على موضوع مثلا انت ذكرت القطاع الخاص وخلينا نحكي على المشغلين على سبيل المثال وهم الحلقه حلقه قويه جدا اقتصاديا نقابات تنظيميا ظروفهم تمام فرح يكون صعب انك تاخذ حق منهم مثلا كمستخدم او مستخدمه ما بتصيرش نحط احنا بمواجهه مشغلين او او انا انحط بمواجهه السائق عشان هيك في منظومه في الدوله موجوده بالنص بيناتنا هي التي تحكم العلاقه ما بيننا ويجب ان تكون هذه العلاقه متكافئه لحد كبير وتراعي النوع الاجتماعي وايضا انا منظوري انه انا تمام حتى النقل العام يجب ان تصبح خدماته للجميع لمن يريد ان يستخدم المنظومه لمن يريد ان يعيش في في مدينه بيئيا يحافظ عليها باستخدام منظومه النقل العام ربما او ياخذ خياره بانه ما يشتريش سياره ما يضطرش انه يستخدم سياره لحد من التنقل عبر السيارات الخاصه والاكتظاظ وما نراه من اثار مختلفه على على حياتنا ف موضوع تنظيم المستخدمين والمستخدمات ورفع صوتهم هذا شيء اساسي يعني لا غنى عنه ولكن ايضا هناك ربما الضغط باتجاه فتح هاي الفئه المنظمه يعني ما نعرفش مين بيجي بالاول مرات بيكون في نظرات تقدميه ربما المجتمع المدني ينجح مثلا في انه يفسح المجال امام المستخدمين والمستخدمات لدخول اروقه صنع القرار ورفع رفع صوتهم والضغط على صناع القرار بانهم يلاقوا لهم مكان على الطاوله ولكن ايضا المستخدمين والمستخدمات عليهم ايضا انهم يعني ما بنحملهم عبء زياده عن ما هم يعانون من 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 صعوبات في هذه الحياه وفي استخدام النقل العام نفسه ولكن يجب ان يكون هناك رفع لصوتهم وتنظيم انفسهم بشكل او باخر. شكرا سهر في فكره وانت بتحكي انه احنا نستخدم حتى عباره متلقي الخدمه او الكاستمر بدل مستخدم يعني احنا بال بال بالترمينولوجي تبع الببليك ترانسبورتيشن بطلنا وي دونت يوز يوزر اني مور وي يوز كاستمر هلا انا كاستمر از ا كاستمر له حقوق مختلفه يعني uh, بتوقع مستوى خدمه معين وبتوقع الـ الـ شركه الحافلات او السائق بده يعاملني ك- كشخص عم بعطيه انا بسهم بدخله المالي فبالتالي يعني هذا انت عم يعني ملاحظاتك ذكرتني بهذا يعني الاستخدام ك ك كاستمر له حقوق وتوقعات وزي ما بروح على مطعم بطلب وجبه ما عجبتني بيجي مدير المطعم بيقول لي ليش شو في عليها ملح زياده وما عملنا كذا وشو قصرنا نفس الشيء بدنا نوصل زي بالمجتمعات اللي عندها انظمه مواصلات عامه متقدمه انه اذا انا بحس انه في شيء خطا او او ناقص بالخدمه اني انا بقدر اعبر عن هذا الشيء. انا عم بطلع على الوقت بعد لنا تقريبا ست دقائق بدي اعطيكم المجال هلا اذا نرجع للملازم خديجه موضوع انت يعني انا تو مي احنا 
قلنا دبي قصه نجاح من المواصلات والصحيح يعني من حابين نعمم هاي التجربه على على منطقه الشرق الاوسط شمال افريقيا زي ما تفضلت الاخت سهر كمان انه وجود هذا العنصر اللي اللي يامن المواصلات العامه مهم جدا ف يعني سؤالي بكون انه حسب حياتك العمليه وتجاربك وخبرتك اذا في شيء انت ممكن تغيريه شو بكون هو هذا الشيء اللي له ممكن علاقه بمهنتك انت ومسيرتك المهنيه كامراه ناجحه في موقع قيادي او له علاقه بالمستخدمين الشرائح المختلفه للمستخدمين زي ما تفضلتي اصحاب الهمم ولا اللي بجوز ما بيعرف الترم هذا بدبي اصحاب الهمم اللي هو احنا بنحكي اللي عندهم اعاقات هون بيستخدموا هذا المصطلح اصحاب الهمم ف شو شو ممكن او يعني شو في شيء تغيري او تحسني والله اني انا استلهم او اشكرك على هذا السؤال اني استلهم الحين اذا ودي اني اغير ولا احسن من كلام زميلتي واختي سحر يوم ذكرت عن تصنيف احتياجات النساء انه مش كل النساء اللي يستخدمون المواصلات العامه احتياجاتهم واحده فصراحه انا انتبهت انا أو واو صح مش كل النساء اللي تستخدم هناك الام هناك الموظفه هناك العامله هناك طلاب طالبات المدارس تردد ودي الحين استفيد ايضا من الدراسه اللي هم سووها اني نسوي شيء على ارض الواقع ايضا احنا نبغى نعرف ايضا صحيح النساء عندنا نحن خليناهم في كاتيجوري واحد ضمن ظلمناهم اكيد في احتياجات كثيره نريد نسمع حتى نفس الموضوع اللي ذكرتوه الان اللي هم صوت مستخدمي وسائل المواصلات نحن الحمد لله موجودين عندنا الار تي اي اللي تاخذ الاصوات بطريقه معينه وعندنا ايضا نحن مركز الاتصال الموحد في امن المواصلات اللي تستمع ايضا للاراء لكن اللي ما لا ان تكون هناك جلسات نقاش دائرات للمستخدمين والمشغلين والمنظمين والاداريين كلها في جلسه واحده مثلا خطر على بالي الان ليش ما نستمع لكل الاصوات ما يكون صوت نعم نحن نجمع الاصوات نحللها نبني عليها قرارات بس لو نتقارب كل الاصوات في مكان واحد يمكن نسمع اشياء جديده يمكن نفهم اشياء جديده تحديات جديده لكن يعني ترجمه لجوابك سحر الهمتني كثيرا جل امانه امانه انا في دبي اشعر بفخر اشعر بفخر بما هي تقوم به امانه يعني وكأن ما تقوم به نحن نقوم به يعني فخر كبير اشعر فيه كامراه فكثير من كلامها الهمني واذا في شيء اكون اذا ودي اسوي شيء دراسات اكبر يمكن احنا هذا الجزء آآ آآ نريد نركز فيه في العالم العربي مش بس في الامارات الدراسات والبحوث ونبدا من من الصفر نحن نشوف احتياجاتنا ما نعتمد فقط على افضل الممارسات الخارجيه ولا افضل التقارير الدوليه مش تقصيرا فيها لكن نحن اولى في منطقتنا ونعرف احتياجاتنا هذا اللي ما لدي احسنتي شو بدي اقول يعني بتحكي على الالهام والله انتم الهمتوني كلكم يعني انا بصراحه امري يعني بحس بالتواضع بهيك بانل ما شاء الله عليكم وهذا الحمد لله اللي يعني احنا حابين هذا التواصل يصير والتشبيك وهون برضه يعني بنشكر زملائنا الاف اي اس لانه بجوز انا شهادتي مجروحه بالنسبه لاني شاركت كثير مع نشاطات معهم دائما ب يعني بقدموا هاي المنصه بحيث انه لا شعوريا في هذا التواصل المباشر والاستفاده من الخبرات والوقت حتى يعني بمشي بسرعه ما بنحس بالوقت لانه عم نسمع معلومات مفيده بارك الله فيك ملازم خديجه على هاي الملاحظات الطيبه ومرة ثانية شكرا انك اخذت الوقت تشاركينا بهاي المنصة. أه سهر الك أه يعني مش عارفة احكي خجلتينا اختنا أه خديجة يعني شكرا جزيلا على هاي الكلمات الطيبة والله يعني احنا ايضا نستلهم منكم دائما خصوصا فيما يتعلق في قديش المساواة فيما يتعلق بين الرجال والنساء على كافة المستويات تحديدا نشوفها في في الفضاء العام وفي سوق العمل ويعني تجربتكم الصراحة فريدة وإحنا 
لازم ويجب وبالعكس نكون مقصرين بحق ذاتنا كشعوب عربية شقيقة إذا لم نستفد من خبرات بعض والخبرة بيننا يعني شعوب جنوب العالم يجب أن تتكاتف فما بالك لما نكون نساء عربيات يعني جالسات مع بعض في هيك منصة ووجود طبعا يعني قامات مثل الدكتور أيمن وغيره وأيضا تحت مظلة أفي أس اللي إحنا نتقاطع معهم بكثير من القيم وقيم العدالة الاجتماعية بشكل كبير فشكرا لك نتشرف انه طبعا نحكي بشكل اكثر وموسع ويمكن ببعث هلا الدرا... رابط لدراستين اجريناهم على النقد العام واحد وحده متخصصه هلا حاليا في نظام في النساء العاملات في قطاع الزراعه وهي صعوباتهم لسه مضاعفه بشكل اكبر ولكن يتم الاستفاده منها فلنا الشرف وبالنهايه يعني مش عارفه شو ب... في زميلتي عادة جنبي وانت ضلت تقولي على موضوع الحضانات طبعا يعني نحبك على موضوع الحضانات معكم ايضا بشكل مباشر يعني هلا موضوع الاعتراف بال الرعائي وهو رسالتنا وهو ايضا هذا العبء اللي تحمله النساء بشكل 70% اكثر من الرجال في كافه انحاء العالم يعني تم تقديره ب 10 تريليون دولار سنويا من قبل مؤسسه اوكسفام خمس النساء فوق سن ال 15 سنه اذا وضعنا قيمه ماديه على هذا العمل اللي بنعمله اللي بي اللي بمنعنا من الخروج او بقلل من فرص خروجنا للفضاء العام بكافه اشكاله فاهم شيء واهم خطوه للتخفيف منه هو انها هاي مدننا تكون اكثر عداله المدينه تكون تحتضن حاجاتي تحتضني انا كامراه بشكلي باحتياجاتي بمكاني في هذا في هذا في هذه الرقعه الجغرافيه فهذا شيء اساسي واهم شيء موضوع التنقل بالنسبه للنساء والفتيات بكافه شرائحهم وكافه احتياجاتهم هذا شيء اساسي هو هي مرات فارق ما بين الفقر والخروج منه وهي ايضا تشكل الفرق والمنظومه مرات تشكل الفرق ما بين التعلم والاميه وما بين القوه الاقتصاديه ورفع الصوت وما بين الانسحاق التام فما بنقلل من من المنظومه واهميتها واهميه انها تكون مراعيه وهي وهي رافعه اساسيه لنهضه اي دوله آه لما نقول مشاركة اقتصادية 14% فهذا شيء مخجل ولكن السبب الرئيسي لعدم خروجنا للساحات العامة هو هذا هذا الانعدام العدالة في هذه المنظومة للنساء والرجال نعم نتفق في ذلك لكن اليوم الأساس أنه نراعي أكثر فئة مهمشة وأكثر شخص مهمش لأنه يستخدم هاي المنظومة عند التخطيط وعند التطبيق وعند المتابعة وعند إعادة الكرة من جديد وشكرا جزيلا لكم ولوقتكم معنا ونحب نضمن على تواصل إن شاء الله شكرا شكرا كثير سحر الحضانات الحضانات والبدأ رح نتذكر خلاص بمحضر الجلسة كانتال I don't see I don't see her screen. She's not with us. Okay. Um, she probably either got disconnected or she had to go. Um, Dina or Sarah, um, I would like to uh, conclude this session, if that's okay by you, by uh, thanking uh, the panelists. Um, and thanking the audience, and I hope that this was as interesting as at least uh, it was to me. Um, I also uh, would, you know, appreciate again creating this network uh, beyond this session. Indeed, I'm very happy to see this uh, potential collaboration. Um, and for those of you who don't know, we have. Um, a small center uh, called the Center for Transport Excellence in Dubai as part of the UITP MENA. And uh, we try to do some studies as well. Uh, and we have collaborated before uh, with some partners in the region to, to look at different issues related to customers, related to uh, attitudes of users. We just finished a project. Uh, we're analyzing the data as we speak. 
uh, on, on the attitudes of uh, travelers in, in uh, the MENA region uh, post COVID-19 to see how, how the travel behavior changed altogether from making trips to which modes we use. Um, so thank you again. And uh, I'd like from uh, my, my position in Dubai today to tell you that tomorrow is a very exciting day uh, in Dubai, inshallah, uh, with the opening of the expo. Uh, I bought my, my ticket last night for uh, one pass for October. Uh, and there is, a, there is a mobility pavilion. There's a mobility theme. It's playing a lot in the expo. So I encourage those of you who can come to Dubai uh, if, for, if for no other reason, like our, you know, the good weather and that it's a safe environment and it's open for business that you can visit the expo. Uh, so uh, I hope you allow me, uh, Mulazim Khadija, to extend this. Uh, and, and I'm sure they are very busy because all my colleagues at RTA and DTS, they don't sleep because they're, they're preparing for this. So thank you very much. Uh, and I turn it back to uh, the organizers. Thank you so much, Ayman. I, I honestly enjoyed every single discussion that, that's been happening. وشكرا جزيلا واتمنى وهذا هدفنا احنا من فريدريش ايفنت بمؤتمرنا اللي هو التشبيك ومشاركه الخبرات والتجارب ووين عملنا صح ووين عملنا غلط مشان نتعلم على مستوى المنطقه في مجال اطلب منكم اللي باستطاعته يفتح الكاميرا بس مشان ناخذ صوره اذا في مجال هذا يكون ممتاز One, two, three, big smiles, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, one last comment, بعد إذنكم. Uh, so, هلا uh, عنا ساعة break uh, للغداء. وبتمنى إن شاء الله الساعة ثلاثة بتوقيت عمان الساعة 12 بتوقيت جي إم تي. ضلكم معنا لأن عنا uh, very interesting session. Uh, the video of sustainable cities conference, sustainability in general. بنحب نفرجيكم اياه وبنحب نناقشه ونحط خطط للمستقبل ان شاء الله فبتمنى اشوفكم ان شاء الله كمان ساعه وصحه وهنا للغدا شكرا جزيلا
Hi. Um, so, Sarah, if it's okay with you, can we just give five minutes for people maybe to re log in? That's okay? Of course, it's okay. Thank you. A lot of participants that were there before the lunch break are not <laughs> yet back, so we should definitely yeah. wait for them Perfect. to join. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.
What do you think, Sarah? I think we can start, start now with the afternoon session. Perfect. Um, so welcome back, everyone. And thank you so much for uh, bearing with us. This is the final session. And um, to be honest, this is uh, a session that I am excited about because the arrangement for this session was so fun and so engaging. Um, so as, as you know, this is the 10th year that we are um, enjoying the Sustainable Cities Conference and in contribution to all the people who were in this wonderful journey with us uh, throughout the past 10 years, we tried to document some of the things and, and some of the actual um, topics and their thoughts and ideas about like sustainability and sustainable cities. And this was done through a video. Uh, we had some online interviews due to the fact that some of our great uh, partners are abroad and we had some face-to-face uh, -face videos. And I thank everyone who contributed to this video because they also dedicated um, time. I know how busy their schedules are, but they managed to dedicate the time for us to do these interviews. And um, so good luck for everyone. And I really hope that you enjoy this video. Um, for our dear translators um, and interpreters, thank you so much. But the video has subtitles, so um, Arabic, English, and English, Arabic. So uh, like, this is just a chance for you to grab a coffee or just take a break because uh, we will not be bothering you with the translation of this. Uh, Sarah, would you like to add anything? Nothing at this point. I'm looking forward to see the video. <laughs> Perfect. So one second. So I... <clears throat> أول إشي بخطر على بالي لما أسمع كلمة استدامة هو منعة المدن لأنه المدن اللي راح نخطط لها للمستقبل مختلفة تماماً عن المدن اللي كنا نعيش فيها حتى وإحنا أطفال أول شيء بيخطر على بالنا هي المشاريع الإنمائية اللي خاصة بالتنقل اللي خاصة بالطاقة هي عبارة عن تول نستخدمها لا يكون المستقبل أفضل الشكل التقليدي في في الحياة في ال... في المنطقة العربية هو هو شكل لحد ما هو هو شكل فيه استدامة تكافؤ موازين القوى بين أضعف فرد في المجتمع وأقوى فرد فيه Uh, sustainable cities mean that uh, they're adapting the conditions that are given to them, you know, the, regardless of the geography, regardless of the climate, uh, to best serve uh, their citizens and their ambitions and their objectives. When I heard the term sustainable cities, the uh, first thing which comes to my mind is clearly future, our future future of mankind because I'm deeply convinced that the future of mankind will be decided in cities. هي المدينة اللي أنا أو أي حد برتاح نفسيا برتاح صحيا بكون مطمن إنه عايش فيه. To me it means having access to open space, having access to good food, good quality food, good quality water, having decent transport and ease of mobility basically. قابلة للعيش للجميع مدن شاملة فيها مرونة ضد الكوارث الطبيعية بتراعي التنوع الثقافي في المجتمع. Cities are a green and livable and inclusive city that offer the same quality of life for future generations as well. كلما زادت العدالة بين السكان والعدالة في التوزيع في المدينة كلما ازدادت الاستدامة فيها الوصول لخدمات بتراعي جنسهم ونوعهم الاجتماعي واحتياجاتهم المبنية على هذا النوع في عنا كتير بوتنشل لنحقق أهداف الاستدامة في جميع المدن المنطقة المين ريجن It is about reversing damage that humans have created to their environmental and social capital within the cities لما نحكي عن الاستدامة في المدن الجميع معني الكل معني فعلا في في هذا الموضوع البلديات طبعا هي لازم تكون راس الحربه وتقود هاي الحلول المستدامه في مدنها الدوله طبعا الحكومه المركزيه لها دور كبير في في وضع الاستراتيجيات والسياسات 
في عنا زيادة في أعداد السكان في عنا شح في الموارد في عنا فرص عمل لازم تنخلق للأجيال القادمة فكيف نقدر نستفيد من الموارد المتاحة لنا بطريقة مستدامة الموضوع الثاني صفرية الكربون يعني كيف ممكن نخلق اقتصاد ما بيؤدي إلى التلوث اللي عم بيساهم في حدوث موضوع التغير المناخي اللي راح يأثر علينا جميعا راح تساهم في تغيير نظرتنا لكثير امور لطريقه بنائنا لطريقه تنقلنا لطريقه تفاعلنا مع المدينه هلا في المنطقه تبعتنا لما نيجي نحكي على السستينابيلتي في كثير شغلات ممكن الواحد يعملها بس من اهم الشغلات هي لما بيجي نحن ناخذ القرار يكون القرار تبعنا استراتيجي ويكون بفكر من ناحيه انه كيف بدنا نفيد المجتمعات بطريقه توصل للاحتياجات تبعتها بدون ما ناذي البيئه لكن غالبيه القرارات اللي عم بتكون عندنا هي بتكون قرارات مفاجئه او استجابة لشغلة معينة ما بتكون بطريقة استراتيجية ولا متكاملة مع مجالات مختلفة لو كنت صانع قرار في مدينة وبدي أجمع الأطراف المعنية باستدامة المدن على طاولة واحدة أول ناس بفكر فيهم هن سكان المدينة نفسهم I would engage everyone uh, I would think the public sector will go without, go without saying that includes both municipal players um, have a say in the development of cities, but also uh, national uh, bodies, uh, ministries, uh, and national agencies that also affect it. The first step is to make a difference in the society بصياغه الخطط يلي هي من شأنها ان تحول المدن الى مدن اكثر استدامه. الاولويه يجب, يجب ان تعطى للمشاة وانه احنا نستطيع ان نمشي للخدمات وبتعرف هلا في مبدا اظن بباريس طلعوه خلال فتره الكورونا مدينه الربع ساعه انه تكون غالبيه الخدمات ممكن توصلها مشيا من خلال ربع ساعه. اول شيء بغير البرايورتيز تاع الاولويات، الاولويه الاولى انه احول المدينه لمدينة صديقة للبشر وصديقة للبيئة لأنه هذه المدينة هي اللي راح تجيب استثمارات وراح تجيب كل التمويل لهالمدينة I would decide on, on a project uh, that would showcase maybe uh, some of the concepts that we want to read نحتاج إحنا اليوم لحلول مستدامة لأنظمة نقل أنظمة نقل عام تشمل الجميع وتخدم الجميع وتقدر إن تقدر إنها تخدم الناس لتوصل لأعمالها ولأماكن تعليمها وللخدمات الاقتصادية وغيرها بشكل سلس وبكلفه قليله وبكلفه على البيئه تكون اقل كمان. I would be working more and more into introducing renewable energy into these cities. توجه اكثر للحلول اللي هي تكون اكثر صديقه للبيئه، اكثر بتقدر الناس تنفذها. المؤتمرات اف اي اس بتغطي مواضيع كثير مهمه وبتهم كثير ناس خارج اطار المشاركين بس بالمؤتمر. بعد المؤتمر بنكتشف قد ايه في تشبيكات. بتبقى موجوده فبنلاقي ان ممكن يبقى في ناس بتتكلم على الزراعه وناس بتتكلم على العمران وناس بتتكلم على المواصلات وفجاه بنلاقي ايه ده 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 الحاجات كلها فعلا مشبكه مع بعض. الحوارات اللي بتتم بين المشاركين ليس فقط خلال الجلسات ولكن ايضا على الهامش. You realize the importance of the network uh, and you realize the importance of bringing colleagues together. افضل شيء نعمل التوبكس اللي عرضت لانها التوبكس كانت كثير مهمه للمشاركين. What we can see as FES we always include youth and women. Children and, and young people in the MENA region, they account for nearly half of the region's um, population. And um, they can thus be seen as, as the region's capital. Um, they can play a major role in, in the energy transition towards um, carbon, decarbonization and climate neutrality. The gender balance that was present on all the panels. And the meeting gave us the opportunity to present the topic, to present the decisions that we were making, to present some examples. So, in my opinion, this meeting is the opportunity to present the information and the decisions. And the thing that is important for the attention is that the meeting is the opportunity to present the challenges that will happen in the Arab countries every year. So, for example, in this year, the idea of the sustainable development is the sustainable development, which is one of the most important things. الامور لازم ناخذها بعين الاعتبار لزياده مناعه مدننا ومجتمعاتنا ضد الفيضانات والكوارث الطبيعيه. فبحب اشوف المؤتمرات القادمه يكون في نوع من المتابعه والاستمراريه للمواضيع اللي بتنطرح في المؤتمر، ممكن هذا يكون على شكل ورقه موقف مثلا. بتمنى بالكونفرنس الجاي انه يشمل شريحه اكبر من المشاركين. الناس العاملين في مجال الرياده والابداع اللي بيطلعوا بحلول 
لكثير من المشاكل البيئيه اللي بنواجهها في مدننا. احنا ابتدينا نشتغل مع الاكاديميين وبتمنى انه فريدريتش ايبرت كمان يشتغلوا اكثر مع الاكاديميين اللي يطلع لنا ريسيرش حقيقي عن عملنا المستقبلي. احنا بالعاده بنصمم مدننا للناس للمجتمعات المحليه فحلو يكون جزء من المجتمعات المحليه كمان حاضره معنا هاي المؤتمرات وعلى اطلاع بالتحديات اللي بنواجهها وشو في حلول ممكن يتم تطبيقها على ارض الواقع في المدن. انا بشجع يكون في اكثر واكثر من هيك مؤتمرات. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dina. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed uh, watching this video, and I know that there was a lot of work behind it. <laughs> so uh, thanks again, Dina, and also Aladin Atie um, for the preparation uh, of this video. And, and of course, um, thanks to all um, our uh, partners um, that were involved in, in this video. Um, yeah, the, the two conference days um, have gone um, by incredibly fast, um, and we have already arrived at the last session of, of this year's Sustainable Cities Conference. Um, we thought that the 10th um, anniversary would be an ideal um, opportunity to look back um, over the past 10 years and, and see what we have achieved so far. Um, where do we stand uh, with sustainable cities? Um, which path um, have already been taken here? Um, we also want to ask ourselves where we are heading and in a third step, how we are going to get there. Um, the, the ideas um, we developed here in the session um, can be ideas for more sustainable cities, um, but also ideas for the sustainable cities um, conference in the future. So, so what issues um, should be taken up here and um, how can we really make a difference um, with the conference um, and so on. Um, we will then take, of course, um, these ideas um, into the planning of the uh, 11th uh, Sustainable Cities Conference, uh, which will most uh, likely take place in Egypt um, early next year. Um, and I also ask you to post um, your ideas on, on the wall of I Years, um, on, on the interface. Um, this way, we, we have everything um, we, we develop here in the session also in, in written form. Um, there are no speeches, um, no inputs um, planned for this session. Um, it is meant to be completely interactive. Um, this is why I ask for your active participation um, and um, and I would say the floor is yours. Um, so everyone who would like to speak, um, please post your question. I don't know, Dina, do we, do we also have the, the possibility that they can? Yes, yeah, yeah, I, they, they can. everyone is activity. able to speak and whomever would love to also open the camera, please do so. We would love to see you as well. And um, for our panelists, for our attendees, everyone is, is uh, more than welcome to share and join. If anyone has a problem, just please let me know, but everyone supposedly can ask and um, can take up the floor, so. Indeed. So I'm looking, but I don't see any raised hands yet. Don't be shy. <laughs> Someone has to start. I see Karim. <laughs> the floor is yours, Karim. I just wanted to say that I really enjoy the Sustainable Cities Conference. I think this is my fifth year. Uh, I, uh, I, so I've attended half of the conferences. As soon as I found out about them, I became a, a big fan. And I, uh, and, and I prefer uh, the focus on cities to any other focus. I've learned something new. Uh, which is focusing on social issues, which um, I think is something that Friedrich Schiebert uh, Stiftung is um, quite passionate about. I wasn't ready uh, in that sphere to start with. I, I tend to focus more on environmental issues. So that was that introduced me to something new that I wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't the, at the forefront of my thinking. So uh, I contribute on the environmental front and the more of the hardware and I learned something about the social issues. So um, 
it was lovely and I look forward to the 20th Sustainable Cities Conference. Thank you very much, Karin, for your feedback. Um, we are very happy, actually, that uh, we have you as, um, as Carbon on, um, as a partner for, for this year's Sustainable Cities Conference. And, and you're right, this is um, our focus always. We always try to combine um, uh, climate change issue, issues with uh, social justice. And it's the same like for sustainable cities. Um, um, we, we always focus there on, on, on gender, on youth, on, um, on especially vulnerable groups. Um, um, so, yeah. so we got the we got the name right this this year. We want to call the Just Cities, which I, which I which I think is either uh, Dina or your uh, responsibility. So yeah. you've got we've got you to thank for that. Okay, so no raised hands at the moment. Dina, please step in. I I really um first of all thank you all and um. If I may, I have two questions for our um, dear participants and, and panelists. Uh, so for the first question is that, so we've been here for 10 years, maybe not all conferences we've been attending, but then again, like we've been working in this field and most of us like learned something and um, I, hope, I certainly hope so. Uh, but my question is that, what would you love to see in the next conference? This is one. And two, I would love to know, how did you know about this conference? So that what, what way we should promote the actual participation in, in, in this conference? Like I would love for you who were engaged, how did you know and how do you suggest that we do next year better to get more people engaged in our Sustainable Cities Conference? And uh, thank you for that. And if I understood correctly, this question isn't for me, this is for our audience here. <laughs> So please um, feel all free to answer Dina's question. I think everyone might be a bit tired or after having probably a heavy lunch <laughs> um, or after attending the whole Sustainable Cities Conference, which um, already took place yesterday, so a two-day event can can be very exhausting, especially in front of the screens. Um, so we have a question in the chat, sir. Yeah, I now read it out loud. Um, your efforts are appreciated. Um, I think you missed talking about the future trends for e-mobility and green transportation in Mina. What is uh, your point of view in this regard? Yeah, um, some part of it is true, but actually we talked about inclusive um, urban mobility, kind of green transportation, I would say. Um, but um, yeah, we, we didn't have a special focus on, on e-mobility, of course. Um, but I think we covered this topic in last year's conference. And um, it's also planned for next year's Sustainable um, Cities Conference to have a focus on transportation and mobility. Um, so please make sure <laughs> to attend the conference next year and then um, you will definitely hear more about that. And we as um, FAS, um, as MENA Regional Climate and Energy Project, we are definitely working on, on these topics um, on a uh, national level here in Jordan but also on a regional level. And um, if you are interested in that, you can also check um, our homepage um, and there will, you will find a lot of publications. Um, we always try to publish them in both uh, languages, in English and in Arabic. Um, any other? questions or someone who would like to answer Dina's questions. Because we would be very interested to hear actually from, from your side, um, from, from the audience um, perspective, um, how to improve um, the Sustainable Cities Conference, how to have, as Dina said, probably more participants um, for this conference and, and how to have an an impact at the end, um, because 
with uh, the Sustainable Cities Conference, we always try to, to bring um, a different people from different fields together and, and to, to um, have an exchange about um, best practices in, in the region, um, yeah, to, to connect people across the region. Um, but of course, in, in the end, we also want, um, want to have a, an impact that, that something is actually like happening and that there's probably a political will <laughs> and that, that there is uh, enough um, finance um, to, to, to implement um, these projects and these ideas and um, to, to have a step um, or to, to move um, towards um, social and sustainable cities. I, I, I might jump in here. Uh, if there is something I th that I would love to see, I think I would um, I think I would love to see more uh, focus on what happens in the Gulf Corporation Council countries. There's very, there's little focus in the last few years. Yes, there has been some representation, um, so it wasn't entirely unrepresented, but uh, there tends to be more focus on the Levant and North Africa and less in the GCC. So if we tend to see more of the some of the innovative things that we have seen, where they relate, of course, to sustainable cities. So for example, there's a lot of focus in some countries of the GCC on smart cities, which uh, is quite, quite an ambiguous term, but some aspects of it relate to sustainability and relate to resilience. So perhaps we could extract some of those and, and dedicate the smart city panel, perhaps, in the, in the framework of uh, socially just and environmentally sustainable cities um, that we that we are um, working within. So that's uh, that's my um, that, that's something that I would like to see. Thank you very much, Karim. We will definitely note that uh, it was actually also on our list of ideas for this year's conference. But then we always have to to make a choice or to make a decision in the end. Um, um, yeah, and I think that. Um, uh, that the yeah the, the GCC countries are not um, that represented uh, is because um, FES has different offices in the region, but uh, not uh, in, in the Gulf countries. <laughs> so um, this is why we sometimes forget the, this part of the region. But uh, I definitely agree. Um, there are a lot of innovations going on and, and also good practices. Um, we can definitely learn from and um, should, should look at uh, the situation in, in these countries as well. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Like if, if not, I don't mind to, to wrap up this conference. <laughs> Dina, yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Um... Okay, so there's a question before I <laughs> in the chat. Yeah, I see it. And I recently started digging into the field of sustainable development. Do you have any advice for me to know more about it? So, Dina, would you like to answer this question? Uh, yes, Yazan, I think you chose the nicest topic to be engaged in. Like it has one of like two of my favorite words like development and sustainable, um, but that's the beauty. But it's so diverse; it has so many aspects that you can actually dig in and focus more on. But my advice to you is that never you limit your like vision. Uh, read a lot, and there's so much uh, like available resources all over. There are some videos, there are some um, interesting topics and investigation, but that the best thing is that you we never stop in that field. Like the topics are always emerging. There's always something new happening. So you need just to keep like keep focusing on what's happening. And uh, we're here to help. We have a big library as FES, and I hope that you take the time to take a uh, look. Uh, our partners, Carbon, also have amazing uh, contributions to this agenda in specific. Um, so our uh, all of other partners like you and Habitat here today with us, GIZ, a lot of them have like so much contributions to this agenda item, but my my personal um, advice, if you allow me, is that keep yourself posted all the time. Just like know what's happening there and just read a lot. You you'll manage to to be one of the pioneers, and hopefully maybe next year you'll be one of our panelists. So thank you. 
I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> also wanted to say, please check out our homepage and as well the, the Kaboom website. Um, they have a lot of very nice like, visuals there, uh, very nice graphics. Um, so, and also the, the social media channel, uh, channels, of course. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, yes, we, I would also recommend watching the short videos that we've released last year on, uh, on sustainability, the basics of sustainability in the MENA region. There are six videos that were produced by um, Friedrich Schieber and Carbon. Um, they summarize the basic issues of sustainable development in the MENA region. And we're, I should, may also put a plug in that we're releasing four videos uh, starting next week on climate change in the MENA region. Of course, that's assuming that Yezen's comment is mostly about the MENA region. Uh, or his question is about the MENA region. So we'll so, uh, follow up on social media and you should find um, little nuggets that would help um, establish the basics, understand the basics in, in a very short period of time. I mean, really, really short videos. Very good. And very good <laughs> mentioning these videos that we produced together. Um, I don't see other questions in the chat. And also no raised hands. Um, so, um, Sarah, if you allow me. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I'm I'm kind of down. Like people are not engaging. Is that fine? I think it's it's been too long uh, days. Um, if you allow me, just I'm, I'm gonna share my screen for one last thing, if you, if you please. Um, so. <clears throat> So if you um, please uh, on this platform, um, there is on the left side there is a feedback voting. If I can kindly ask uh, of you joining us here, I'm sorry, like I, it won't open because I already did it just to see how it works. Uh, if you just click here, you'll have just like a couple of multiple um, choice questions. If you can just take like two minutes to to vote. That would be perfect. And uh, we'll show and, and share the results of the voting. If that's okay with you, everyone, that would be perfect. Perfect. Thank you for mentioning this. Uh, Karim, yeah? I was just going to say that it, it will remain available for a while. So people, we could send the link uh, to people to, to participate afterwards as well. That's good. And we can also send it like to the participants of the first day, for example, that everyone can um, can send us um, their feedback on the conference. Yeah. Okay, then I um, would um, wrap up um, the two days of the conference, um, uh, and uh, I would like to do to, to summarize uh, the two days and and to give a little closing speech. Um, usually at the end of such a conference, um, especially if it's online, everyone is very exhausted at the end, and we've seen that. <laughs> Um, uh, in, in this session, and um, therefore I will be very brief. Um, during the conference, um, we looked at the topic um, of uh, sustainable cities from many um, different angles. On the first day of the conference, um, we had a session on uh, equitable um, access to health and well-being in cities. Um, we found that the corona pandemic was very impactful here, um, also a kind of wake-up call for many cities. Um, at at the same time, we concluded um, that we often uh, lack data and, and also finance. Um, a new social contract um, was mentioned um, from, from a speaker. Um, she, she said we need this new social con uh, contract. Um, we also need uh, an international uh, multilateralism and more um, solidarity between different countries. In the um, poster session afterwards, um, we ventured uh, a look into the future. Um, many participants um, presented their vision for um, their cities in 2030. Um, many elements from the posters can also be found in the other posters. And I think that, this, um, that with this um, collection of posters, we have developed a very progressive um, vision um, for cities in the future. And let us hope that this visionary um, thinking also spills over uh, into politics in uh, the countries um, of the MENA region. 
In the last session of um, the first conference day, um, we looked at how uh, just transition can move um, uh, forward at, at the local level. Um, can advance there. Um, we gained um, insights uh, into many initiatives, uh, including the local climate action development guidebook by the GIZ. And um, we learned um, from the World Bank um, about different um, funding um, opportunities and um, finance opportunities uh, for cities. And um, the, the speaker from the World Bank said that um, national development banks and commercial banks also play an important role here, not only international donors um, and, and the World Bank, of course. <laughs> um, then um, today's um, conference, um, uh, they um, started with a, a panel on um, nature-based solutions and clean infrastructure. Uh, we learned more about uh, blue-green infrastructure in a presentation that was given by Dr. Ami Gohar. And um, we also learned about specific um, projects in this field um, by um, the GIZ, um, UN Habitat, and uh, GAM, the, the Greater Amman Municipality. Um, the corona pandemic was here also a kind of eye-opener and, and that we need more open and um, public and green spaces. Um, and I think there are already like many initiatives and, and best practice examples in this area in parts in some parts of the MENA region. But at the same time, of course, um, there needs to be more commitment, um, more support from the political side to take bigger steps. And I also found the discussion very interesting here on how we can promote um, green infrastructure while also keeping social um, justice in mind. Um, the second panel today was on inclusive um, urban mobility with a special focus on gender equality. And we heard about the projects of the um, Jordanian Ministry of Transport um, in this regard. And, and Saha Alul from Sadaka pointed out to the challenges um, that are still ahead of us. And the panelists agreed that the voice of the public transport users um, need to be strengthened. Um, and, and, um, and we also got an insight into a bicycle um, project in Marrakesh in Morocco. So um, civil um, society initiatives can, can do a lot in this area um, and, and broad, um, broad alliances. Um, but in the end, uh, it also needs, of course, um, the political will and um, also um, the, the, the support of, of um, the population. Um, the last um, session um, is <laughs> certainly still fresh in your minds. Um, so I will not summarize it. But um, I would like to assure you that we will take the ideas that were mentioned um, for the planning of um, the future conferences um, with, with us. Um, for, for us, the, the 10th um, Sustainable Cities Conference was a great uh, success. And therefore, I would like to, to express my, my gratitude once again and, and thank um, Karima Jandi um, from Kaboon as a cooperation partner for this event. Um, big thanks also to, to Dina um, and, and Aladin Atje, um, as well as to Farah Karaf, Kalaf, um, the, our um, finance manager. Um, thanks to the interpreters. Um, I, I was able to understand everything that was, was said in Arabic, so thanks a lot. Um, and um, a big uh, thank you to all the speakers, the moderators, and everyone else who has um, contributed to this conference. Um, I always see so many um, active and uh, committed people in this field, and I'm sure that together we can make um, the cities in the MENA region more um, social and more sustainable. Uh, and we hope um, that we can count on your participation for the 11th uh, conference, um, which will probably take place in Egypt um, early next year. So thanks again to everyone and, um, and see you for the next Sustainable Cities Conference or even before when we have an event um, of our um, MENA Climate and Energy Project. Bye.